In the early years of the church it was repeatedly taught that endowed and married women held the priesthood in connection with their husbands and had the same rights, blessings, powers and privileges, but gradually the expression of that point of view was discouraged and suppressed. In recent years, however, that teaching has been rediscovered and many women are clamoring for those rights again. The problem is understanding the correct nature and exercise of this priesthood. Some women want it conferred on them with the subsequent ordination to a priesthood office in the church. Even some men have supported this position, such as James Chapman who wrote. Mormon males are taught from infancy that the priesthood will be given to them by a just, kind and loving father in heaven, as one of the most desirable and useful gifts they could ever possess in this life and throughout eternity. Females are taught that God wasn't referring to them, that he has made them unacceptable, as human beings, to hold priesthood office. What effect does it have on a woman's image of herself when she is instructed that no matter what she does, she cannot gain equal status with men in the eyes of God? What is her reaction to this message? Will it inspire her to do good, to love God, to be at peace with herself and others? And what of the men throughout her lifetime who convey this message to her? Will they be filled with love, humility and compassion? Will a deep sense of human equality and empathy guide their involvement with women? What does it do to a woman, a young girl, to hear over and over again in so many ways, and at all times, that because she is female, she has been denied by God and made unqualified to hold priesthood as men can? What does it do to a woman's sense of her own worth to know that in the most important realm of her life, she is not valued as men are valued and will never have the same chances and opportunities as they will have? S.L. Tribune, September 2, 1990. Mr. Chapman concedes that his frustration would be lessened by giving women the same offices in the church that male members are entitled to. He concluded. Optimistically, however, a new and promising perspective is beginning to surface. A growing number of Latter-day Saints now feel that lack of priesthood office should in no way preclude female participation in all governing units of the modern church. Talented and loving women will be as effective in Mormon bishoprics, state presidencies, high councils, and in the ranks of general authorities as males will be. I bid. Other public voices have supported the same proposition, i.e. Edwin Vermage. University of Utah law professor Edwin Vermage says there is no doctrinal basis for the Mormon Church's restriction against women holding the Church's priesthood or other authoritative offices. Within my own religious tradition, I long for that time when four black people, three of them women, will sit on the stand as general authorities at general conference said Mr. Fermage, referring to offices in the LDS church that currently only men may hold. No reason exists in Mormon doctrine, I believe, to prevent full priesthood participation by women with every office and calling in the church being open to them, he said at the annual Monsignor McDougall lecture at the Cathedral of the Madeleine. Imagine four black, Mormon, general authorities, three of them female he said. This profound visual message of healing would transcend in immediate healing power, every sermon ever given in our holy house, the Mormon tabernacle. S.L. Tribune, March 9, 1989. With this approach, Mr. Firmage is taking an opposite view from prophets, patriarchs and apostles of the past 6,000 years. He concludes with his own view of how he is reconciled to God, which sounds more confusing than sensible. Reconciliation with God comes from introspection, understanding others, and correcting injustices. Within my own soul I become male and female, Mormon and Catholic, Jew, Muslim and Hindu, Russian and American, black, brown and white he said. I bid. Paul likens the church to a human body, each person being a vital part of that church, and all are necessary for it to function properly. Women are a part of that church body perhaps the inner part that is not so visible, but their functions and contributions are just as necessary as any other part. Paul says that the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor can any part say that it has no need of any of the other parts. See I Cor. 12 14-23, it is also necessary to understand that one part cannot desire to be some other part. The rib cannot say that she wants to be the arm, or the eye or the head. Whatever the calling that God gives us, we should be satisfied with it. Thus, a woman should graciously accept the fact that her priesthood callings are not elder, bishop, seventy or apostle but wife, mother, teacher and comforter. These are at least as important and demanding as any of those exercised by men. Rodney Turner, Woman and the Priesthood, page 286. Priesthood never has been just a badge, title, rank, position or office, but rather authority, leadership and rule, that when exercised righteously is a guide and influence in the family showing the way back to our Heavenly Father's presence. Governing the Church. 
churches may grow, prosper, and do great missionary service in the name of Christ, but they may or may not be governed by priesthood. They can lose it more easily than they gained it. When church leaders call people to hold offices in its organization, they may or may not be inspired to make those choices. Those calls to offices and missions usually come from the organization, the power and authority of priesthood comes from God. Hence, there is usually an eventual separation between church and priesthood. Men are called to offices, but the gifts, powers, and revelations to magnify those callings come through the power of God. When the division between church offices and priesthood callings becomes too great, it becomes obvious as Margaret Toscano stated. Some Mormon women want nothing to do with the hierarchical priesthood system that operates the modern church. They see priesthood leadership as power-centered and corruptible. Put on your strength. Dot dot women and authority, page 418. Too often the priesthood is used as a means for position, gain or authority over people, instead of a power to purify and bring souls to God. It should not make dictators out of men, but rather make them more understanding and charitable. If priesthood is used to gain power or authority over people, then its spirituality becomes dead, the gifts are lost, and the priesthood departs. Nothing is left but the vanity and unrighteous dominion of man. God has established that revelation should be directed to men for the governing of the priesthood and its quorums in the church. Joseph F. Smith called our attention to this. I want to tell you another thing. Our Heavenly Father has never yet to my knowledge revealed to this church any great principle through a woman. Now, sisters, do not cast me off or deny the faith, because I tell you that God has never revealed any great and essential truth for the guidance of the Latter-day Saints through any woman. Oh. Bud says one, what about Eliza Snow's beautiful hymn back quote oh, my father, thou that wellest etc.? Did not the Lord reveal through her that great and glorious principle that we have a mother as well as a father in heaven? No. God revealed that principle to Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith revealed it to Eliza Snow Smith, his wife, and Eliza Snow was inspired, being a poet, to put it into verse. If we give anybody on earth credit for that, we give it to the prophet Joseph Smith. But first of all we give it to God, who revealed it to his servant the prophet. God reveals himself and his truths through the channels of the priesthood. Collected Discourses, 4-229, January 20, 1895. The Times and Seasons editor had previously noted this in 1840. The piece further states that a woman preacher appointed a meeting at New Salem, Ohio, and in the meeting read and repeated copious extracts from the Book of Mormon. Now it is a fact well known that we have not had a female preacher in our connection, for we do not believe in a female priesthood. T and S, 146. But this policy is definitely opposed by some women today, such as Andrea Emmett, who feels women should be entitled to hold priesthood offices in the church. There are no female apostles, female seventies, female high counselors, priestesses, female bishops, stake, mission, quorum, or Sunday school presidents, etc. Directives from the women's general auxiliary leaders to the female membership are addressed dear brethren and signed by the first presidency. Male leaders make all the policies and decisions on every level for all members, male and female. With their totally male perspective, they write, define, and expound on what it means to be, and how to be, a woman. Subordination of Women Within the Latter-day Saint Church, page 4, Emmett, Sunstone Symposium Panel Discussion, 1990. Let's see what the Prophet Joseph Smith had to say about this concept. When he learned about a church organization called the Irvingites, he said, the Irvingites are a people that have counterfeited the truth, perhaps the nearest of any of our modern sectarians. TPJS, page 210, they had apostles, prophets, teachers, etc., and professed having some spiritual gifts. On one of Mr. Irving's journeys in Scotland, he met some Mrs. Campbell who had the gift of utterances, and when they were introduced into Mr. Irving's church in London, they were termed prophetesses of God. They organized the church and when they spoke, Mr. Irving and his ministers had to keep silent. The prophet clearly explained the reasons why Mr. Irving's church was not of God. It may be asked, where is there anything in all this that is wrong? First. The church was organized by women, and God placed in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, and not first women, but Mr. Irving placed in his church first women, secondarily apostles, and the church was founded and organized by them. A woman has no right to found or organize a church God, never sent them to do it. Second. Those women would speak in the midst of a meeting and rebuke Mr. Irving or any of the church. 
Now the scripture positively says, Thou shalt not rebuke an elder, but entreat him as a father not only this, but they frequently accused the brethren, thus placing themselves in the seat of Satan, who is emphatically called the accuser of the brethren. TPJS, page 212. Joseph Smith also similarly criticized a church organized by Johanna Southcott, who claimed to be a prophetess. She wrote a book about her prophecies in 1804, and her church was still active at the time Joseph spoke of it. She Johanna Southcott was to bring forth, in a place appointed, a son, that was to be the Messiah, which thing has veiled. Independent of this, however, where do we read of a woman that was the founder of a church, in the word of God? Paul told the women in his day, to keep silence in the church, and that if they wished to know anything to ask their husbands at home, he would not suffer a woman to rule, or to usurp authority in the church, but here we find a woman the founder of a church, the revelator and guide. The Alpha and Omega, contrary to all acknowledged rule, principle, and order. TPJS, page 209. Apparently this same warning and caution should be taken regarding any woman starting churches, such as the famous Ann Lee of the Quakers, and more recently the pillar of the Seventh-day Adventists, Ellen G. White. Brigham Young also cautioned. When the servants of God in any age have consented to follow a woman for a leader, either in a public or a family capacity, they have sunk beneath the standard their organization has bitted them for, when a people of God submit to that, their priesthood is taken from them. And they become as any other people. JD 9308. The holding of a particular office in the church is not necessarily an indication of the possession of priesthood. Offices merely signify appendages, callings, functions, missions or types of work, they do not reflect or measure the amount of priesthood a person has. For instance, if a person receives the Melchizedek priesthood, then any office in the church or priesthood will never give him any more priesthood it just provides him the opportunity or calling of using his priesthood in whatever function that office requires. Though very rare, a man holding the priesthood may have no office in the church at all, but no office does not necessarily mean he has no priesthood. For example, when the Aaronic priesthood was conferred upon Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery in May 1829, John the Baptist made no mention of ordaining them to any office within that priesthood. Upon you my fellow servants, in the name of Messiah, I confer the priesthood of Aaron, which holds the keys of the ministering of angels, and of the gospel of repentance, and a baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. And it shall never be taken again from the earth, until the sons of Levi do offer again an offering unto the Lord in righteousness. P of GP, Joes. Smith 269. It was not until after the church was organized in April of 1830 that they held an office in the priesthood or church. According to Michael Quinn, it is similarly possible for a woman to hold the priesthood and yet not be ordained to any office in it. Priesthood exists independently of church offices, but church offices are appendages which cannot exist without the priesthood. A woman does not need an appendage to have priesthood. According to Joseph Smith's teachings to the Relief Society and to the Anointed Quorum, a woman receives Melchizedek priesthood when she receives the endowment. The confusion of priesthood office with priesthood has characterized many contemporary discussions of women in priesthood. However, just as counselors in the First Presidency were ordained by Joseph Smith, Emma Smith was ordained to expound the scriptures, DHC 4553, and her counselors were ordained to preside over the Novel Relief Society. In the 19th century the word ordain was also used for appointing persons to proselyting missions and to heal. However, I find no evidence that Mormon men ever ordained a woman to a specific priesthood office of the church. Mormon women have had the priesthood since 1843 Quinn, Women and Authority, page 375. Quinn also said, for LDS women, Melchizedek priesthood does not come in stages of ordination, but in the temple endowment. I bid. Page 384, this will be discussed in the next chapter. Chapter 8. The Temple Endowment. The Significance of the Endowment. Included as an introduction to this chapter is an excerpt from a sermon given by Brigham Young in the Salt Lake Tabernacle, April 6, 1853, when the cornerstone for the SL Temple was laid, wherein he emphasized the importance of temples and the endowment. Soon after the Restoration, the Church, through our beloved Prophet Joseph, was commanded to build a temple to the Most High in Kirtland, Ohio, and this was the next house of the Lord we hear of on the earth, since the days of Solomon's temple. Joseph not only received revelation and commandment to build a temple, but he received a pattern also, as did Moses for the tabernacle and Solomon for his temple, for without a pattern, 
he could not know what was wanting, having never seen one, and not having experienced its use. Without revelation, Joseph could not know what was wanting, any more than any other man, and, without commandment, the church were too few in numbers, too weak in faith, and too poor in purse, to attempt such a mighty enterprise. But by means of all these stimulants, a mere handful of men, living on air, and a little hominy and milk, and often salt or no salt when milk could not be had, the great prophet Joseph, in the stone quarry, quarrying rock with his own hands, and a few men in the church. Following his example of obedience and diligence wherever most needed, with laborers on the walls, holding the sword in one hand to protect themselves from the mob, while they placed the stone and moved the trowel with the other, the Kirtland Temple. The second house of the Lord that we have any published record of on the earth, was so far completed as to be dedicated. And those first elders who helped to build it, received a portion of their first endowments, or we might say more clearly, some of the first, or introductory, or initiatory ordinances preparatory to an endowment. The preparatory ordinances there administered, though accompanied by the ministration of angels, and the presence of the Lord Jesus, were but a faint similitude of the ordinances of the house of the Lord in their fullness, yet many, through the instigation of the devil, thought they had received all, and knew as much as God, they have apostatized, and gone to hell. But be assured, brethren, there are but few, very few of the elders of Israel, now on earth, who know the meaning of the word endowment. To know, they must experience, and to experience, a temple must be built. Let me give you the definition in brief. Your endowment is to receive all those ordinances in the house of the Lord, which are necessary for you, after you have departed this life, to enable you to walk back to the presence of the Father, passing the angels who stand as sentinels. Being enabled to give them the key words, the signs and tokens, pertaining to the holy priesthood, and gain your eternal exaltation in spite of earth and hell. Who has received and need not suppose he can again destroy the holy priesthood from the earth, by killing a few, for he cannot do it. God has set his hand, for the last time, to redeem his people, the honest in heart, and Lucifer cannot hinder him. Before these endowments could be given at Kirtland, the saints had to flee before mobocracy. And, by toil and daily labor, they found places in Missouri, where they laid the cornerstones of temples, in Zion and her stakes, and then had to retreat to Illinois. To save the lives of those who could get away alive from Missouri, where fell the apostle David W. Patton, with many like associates, and where they were imprisoned in loathsome dungeons, and fed on human flesh, Joseph and Hiram, and many others. But before this had transpired, the temple at Kirtland had fallen into the hands of wicked men, and by them been polluted, like the temple at Jerusalem, and consequently, it was disowned by the father and the son. At Nauvoo, Joseph dedicated another temple, the third on record. He knew what was wanting, for he had previously given most of the prominent individuals then before him their endowment. He needed no revelation, then, of a thing he had long experienced, any more than those now do, who have experienced the same things. It is only where experience fails, that revelation is needed. The temple at Nauvoo passed into the hands of the enemy, who polluted it to that extent the Lord not only ceased to occupy it, but he loathed to have it called by his name, and permitted the wrath of its possessors to purify it by fire. As a token of what will speedily fall on them and their habitations, unless they repent. But what are we here for, this day? To celebrate the birthday of our religion. To lay the foundation of a temple to the Most High God, so that when his son, our elder brother, shall again appear, he may have a place where he can lay his head, and not only spend a night or a day, but find a place of peace, that he may stay till he can say, I am satisfied. JD 2 31, 32, 33. The Melchizedek priesthood, which a woman shares in conjunction with her husband, is the authority by which the power of godliness is manifested. In preparation to receive the first endowment, this higher priesthood is necessary. And this greater priesthood administereth the gospel and holdeth the key of the mysteries of the kingdom, even the key of the knowledge of God. Therefore, in the ordinances thereof, the power of godliness is manifest. And without the ordinances thereof, and the authority of the priesthood, the power of godliness is not manifest unto men in the flesh, for without this no man can see the face of God, even the Father, and live. Now this Moses plainly taught to the children of Israel in the wilderness, and sought diligently to sanctify his people that they might behold the face of God. But they hardened their hearts and could not endure his presence, therefore, the Lord in his wrath, for his anger was kindled against them, swore that they should not enter into his rest while in the wilderness, which rest is the fullness of his glory. Therefore, he took Moses out of their midst, and the holy priesthood also, 
and the lesser priesthood continued, which priesthood holded the key of the ministering of angels in the preparatory gospel. D&C 84:19-26. The first endowment. Among the most important instructions, commandments and ordinances taught to the early church members by the prophet Joseph Smith was the temple endowment. The endowment you are so anxious about, you cannot comprehend now, nor could Gabriel explain it to the understanding of your dark minds, but strive to be prepared in your hearts, be faithful in all things, that when we meet in the solemn assembly, that is, when such as God shall name out of all the official members shall meet, we must be clean every whit. TPJS, page 91. Nevertheless, an effort should be put forth to understand as clearly as possible the meaning and nature of the endowment especially by those who wish to magnify their priesthood. John A. Witso explained. The temple endowment relates the story of man's eternal journey, sets forth the conditions upon which progress in the eternal journey depends, requires covenants or agreements of those participating to accept and use the laws of progress gives tests by which our willingness and fitness for righteousness may be known, and finally points out the ultimate destiny of those who love truth and live by it. PRST. And CH. Governor, Widso, page 333. There are some who think that a woman receives the priesthood when she gets her endowment. However, Heber C. Kimball clarified this. Yes, it applies to you ladies, in your family capacity. You have not any priesthood, only in connection with your husbands. You suppose that you receive the priesthood when you receive your endowments, but the priesthood is on your husband's. JD 531. This is also mentioned by Michael Homer, Salt Lake City attorney, in his Sunstone paper, presented in Salt Lake City, August 1994. Even if Joseph Smith did not initially distinguish between holding and sharing the priesthood, and some ambiguity was created when he and other church leaders refer to the endowment as priesthood, perhaps because of its Masonic connection. Church leaders after the death of Joseph Smith have consistently taught that women do not hold the priesthood individually. Mormon women in sacred ritual. From the Female Relief Society to the Holy Order. Even though the endowment is not an actual conferral of priesthood, it does embrace the blessings, powers, privileges, and gifts from on high that pertain to that priesthood. Heber C. Kimball spoke to those who had received their first endowment. You have been anointed to be kings and priests or queens and priestesses, but you have not been ordained to it yet, and you have got to get it by being faithful. In the second anointing, the husband and wife are ordained king and queen, priest and priestess to the Most High God for time and throughout all eternity. Woman's Exponent 1361, September 15, 1884. Women, as well as men, can participate in both these privileges and blessings of the priesthood. When the Relief Society was about to be organized, the prophet told the sisters, I am glad to have the opportunity of organizing the women, as a part of the priesthood belongs to them. And, I will organize the sisters under the priesthood after a pattern of the priesthood. Sarah S. Levitt Autobiography, as quoted in Mormon Enigma, New Elan Avery, page 106, and Women's Voices, Godfrey, et al. See pages 27-29. He did not say with the priesthood or in the priesthood, but under the priesthood and after the pattern of priesthood. In 1906 Relief Society President Bathsheba Smith and Secretary Emmeline Wells corrected a published historical account of the first Relief Society meeting that included Sarah M. Kimball's recollection that the prophet had desired to organize women in the order of the priesthood. Almost certainly at the request of the priesthood leaders concerned about misunderstanding, they searched for the phrase in the original Relief Society minutes and confirmed that no such statement was made there. Relief Society Jubilee Woman's Exponent 2141, April 1, 1892. The prophet indicated that both men and women are a part of the organization of priesthood and that dot 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 the sisters would come in possession of the privileges, blessings, and gifts of the priesthood and that signs should follow them. Dot dot, DHC 4602. This would include the privilege and blessings of the Temple Endowment. Joseph Smith also gave another important message to the Relief Society in April of 1842. He spoke of delivering the keys to this society and to the church that according to his prayers, God had appointed him elsewhere. That the keys of the kingdom are about to be given to them, that they may be able to detect everything false as well as to the elders. Words of Joseph Smith, Comp. By Ehud and Cook, page 117. This same passage reads a little differently in the DHC. He spoke of delivering the keys of the priesthood to the church and said that the faithful members of the Relief Society should receive them in connection with their husbands, that the saints whose integrity has been tried and proved faithful might know how to ask the Lord and receive an answer. 
for according to his prayers, God had appointed him elsewhere. For the keys of the kingdom are about to be given to them church leaders, that they may be able to detect everything false. DHC 460405. This quote seems to be saying that with the priesthood keys delivered to the church, both men and women would then be able to learn the true order of prayer, in order to receive answers to their prayers and detect everything false. It was shortly after this that Joseph transferred the keys of the kingdom from his shoulders to those of the twelve, with instructions that they should give them to others. Some researchers feel that when Joseph Smith mentioned delivering the keys to this society in April 1842, he desired to give them priesthood, but Michael Homer interestingly points out that this took place. Dot 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 before the endowment had been given to the initial nine male members of the Holy Order, and more than one and a half years before any women joined the order. In September 1843 wives began to be endowed, anointed and sealed in plural marriage. It is therefore more likely that the keys referred to the creation of a society, which is the official interpretation, rather than priesthood. Dot 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 1994 SLC Sunstone Symposium Paper, Op. Sit. On the 28th of May in 1843, Joseph Smith and Emma were sealed in marriage for time and eternity. This marriage ceremony consisted of promises and privileges pertaining to both mortality and eternity. In this ordinance Emma was promised that she could receive every blessing and promised that he should receive, based on her faithfulness unto the end, i.e., wherever he could go, she could go, there were no restrictions or qualifications, because she did not have the priesthood. According to a statement by press. Wilfred Woodruff, no man should administer in any of the ordinances in the temple without the priesthood. Joseph Smith did not call upon any man to ordain or to baptize him, but he waited until the Lord sent forth his servants to administer unto him. He was commanded of the Lord to go forth and be baptized, but not until he had received the priesthood. Where did he get it, and in fact what is the priesthood? It is the authority of God in heaven to the sons of men to administer in any of the ordinances of his house. There never was a man and never will be a man, in this or any other age of the world, who has power and authority to administer in one of the ordinances of the house of God, unless he is called of God as was Aaron, unless he has the holy priesthood. And is administered to by those holding that authority. There was no man on the face of the earth, nor had been for the last seventeen centuries, who had power and authority from God to go forth and administer in one of the ordinances of the house of God. As quoted in PRST. And CH. Governor, Widso, page 27. And Widso also explained. Ordinations of men to the Melchizedek priesthood are performed as a necessary prerequisite to receiving the endowment of the temple. Ibid. Page 333. With women, however, it is a little different. It is a precept of the church that women of the church share the authority of the priesthood with their husbands, actual or prospective, and therefore women, whether taking the endowment for themselves or for the dead, are not ordained to specific rank in the priesthood. Nevertheless there is no grade, rank, or phase of the temple endowment to which women are not eligible on an equality with men. True, there are certain of the higher ordinances to which an unmarried woman cannot be admitted, but the rule is equally in force as to a bachelor. The married state is regarded as sacred, sanctified, and holy in all temple procedure, and within the house of the Lord, the woman is the equal and the help meet of the man. In the privileges and blessings of that holy place, the utterance of Paul is regarded as a scriptural decree in full force and effect. Neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man, in the Lord. The house of the Lord, Tomage, page 94. The priesthood is a power which extends beyond the grave, even being necessary to stand in the presence of God. Quoting again from Apostle Widso. Perhaps in no manner is the power of the priesthood more evident than in the authority that it possesses to seal for time and eternity. For example, marriages may be consummated within the church for all time not merely until death doth them part. Family relationships may be continued throughout the eternities. The power of the priesthood extends beyond the grave. Temple work, including baptism, the endowment, sealing, etc., is a function of the priesthood. It is by this power that work for the dead may be done. It is by the power of the priesthood that a person may attain celestial glory. Without the power of the priesthood one cannot enter the presence of God. PRST. And CH. Governor, page 42. Thus, if a woman is to stand before God, then it is through this same priesthood power that she is able to do so. The first endowment, then, shows men and women what they can achieve, based upon their faithfulness and worthiness a conditional promise that they can become such. 
In the second anointing, the husband and wife, or wives, are actually ordained king and queen, priest and priestess to the Most High God for time and throughout all eternity. Juve. Inst. 15111. The second anointing. September 28, 1843, exactly four months after their marriage had been sealed, Joseph and Emma Smith received their second anointing in an upper room of the Novo Mansion House. They were the first couple in this dispensation to be anointed and ordained to the highest and holiest order of the priesthood, also referred to as the fullness of the priesthood. See Joseph Smith's Introduction of Temple Ordinances. Andrew Ehit, pages 94 to 96. This higher ordinance was sometimes called a second endowment, which is really not accurate because there is only one endowment for a person. Other terms are highest ordinance and higher blessings, but the more proper term was given by Wilfred Woodruff's first presidency when people were writing to him to sign their temple recommend. They wrote. This decision applies to all ordinances attended to in the house of the Lord, except second anointings, which last named will still require the approval of the president of the church before they can be administered. Mess. At the first press. Clark. 3 228. It has been assumed by some that priesthood was actually conferred upon women either in the first endowment or the second anointing. However, the wording in both of these ordinances makes no mention of conferring priesthood through those administrations. Prior to the actual second anointing ceremony, there should be the ordinance of washing of feet. Having authority of Jesus Christ, I wash your right foot that you may forever step forward in the cause of truth and righteousness and your left foot that you may forever stand fast in defense of the faith and testimony of Jesus. Dot dot dot. Second anointings, a brief look at a little known ordinance by Lysel G. Brown. Then when the brethren receive their second anointings, there is an advancement to a higher priesthood office or title a king and a priest and to God. With this anointing, however, there is no more a new priesthood conferred on them. The wording in the second anointing as it was given in the Nauvoo Temple to some of the twelve apostles by Brigham Young is included in the following reference. Press. Brigham Young proceeded to anoint B.R. Heber C. Kimball and violate his wife and pronounced the following blessings namely, Bro. Heber Chase Kimball, in the name of Jesus Christ we pour upon thy head this holy oil, and we anoint thee a king and a priest unto the Most High God, in and over the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and also Israel in this the holy temple of the Lord at Nauvoo, the city of Joseph. State of Illinois. Dot 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 Book of Anointings Page 3, Church Historian's Office Library. Remainder of ordinance wording is in the possession of the author, describing the anointing of his head, ears, eyes, and mouth. He then anointed Sister Violet Kimball a queen and priestess unto her husband, H. Z. Kimball, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and in Israel, and pronounced all the blessings upon her head in common with her husband. Ibid. Page 4. When Heber C. Kimball anointed Brigham Young for his second anointing, these words were used. Brother Brigham Young, I pour this holy, consecrated oil upon your head and anoint thee a king and a priest of the Most High God over the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and unto all Israel. He then proceeded in the anointing of the various parts of the body, etc. For there shall be given unto thee crowns and kingdoms and dominions. Dot, dot, dot. Ibid. Page 2. President Kimball then anointed Mary Ann Young, wife of Brigham Young. Sister Mary Ann Young, I pour upon thy head this holy, consecrated oil, and seal upon thee all the blessings of the everlasting priesthood, in conjunction with thy husband. And I anoint thee to be a queen and priestess unto thy husband, over the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And thou shalt be heir to all the blessings which are sealed upon him, inasmuch as thou dost obey his counsel, and thou shalt receive glory, honor, power and exultation in his exultation, and thou shalt be a strength in thy mind, for thou shalt have visions and manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And a time shall come that angels shall visit thee and minister unto thee and teach thee, and in the absence of thy husband shall comfort thee and make known his situation. And I seal thee up unto eternal life, thou shalt come forth in the morning of the first resurrection and inherit with him all the honors, glories, and power of eternal lives, and that thou shalt attain unto the eternal Godhead, so thy exaltation shall be perfect, and thy glory be full. In a fullness of power and exaltation. Ibid. Pages 4 to 5. There are a few points in the above ceremony that need to be emphasized. 1. The blessings of the priesthood were sealed upon her not the priesthood itself. 2. These blessings were sealed in conjunction with her husband. 3. She was anointed to be a queen and priestess unto her husband. 4. 
she would be heir to the same blessings that were sealed upon her husband. 5. She was still instructed to obey her husband's counsel. 6. She would receive glory, honor, power and exultation in his exultation. 7. No priesthood was actually conferred upon her. It is once again evident that even after receiving the second anointing, the woman holds the priesthood only in conjunction with her husband and enjoys the benefits of its blessings and powers through him. As in every kingly status, the king still presides over the queen. An anointed king in the priesthood is the supreme head, the governor or president over that house or kingdom, yet the queen shares in all he possesses, both temporal and spiritual. This established order continues to exist even outside the eternal family unit, for Isaiah stated. And kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth, and lick up the dust of thy feet, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Isa. 4923. Why would kings and queens bow down to someone else? Simply because of a higher authority a greater king and queen than those of an earthly calling. The disciples of Jesus admitted this, for John wrote that Jesus has made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign on the earth. Rev. 5.10, John called him the king of kings, 17.14. He is the king of other kings which he so ordained as his kings and their queens. It was written in the law of the Lord on high, that they that overcome by obedience, should be made kings and queens, and priests and priestesses to God and his father, through the atonement of the eldest son, and that natural eyes should not see, nor natural ears hear. Neither should the natural heart conceive the great, glorious, and eternal things, honors and blessings, that were then, in the Father's dominions, and mansions, prepared in the beginning for them that kept the faith to the end, and entered triumphantly into their third estates. The Eternal Life. T and S 6 917. The receiving of this second anointing should be a primary objective of all righteous men and women who call themselves saints. Charles W. Penrose admonished. We should be a nation of kings and priests unto God, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people zealous of good works. This is what we should be, my brethren and sisters. J.D. 2127. These were blessings and promises which have rarely been on the earth, and when they have been here, most of the people were unworthy of them. As George Q. Cannon stated. But God designed when he led Israel out of Egypt to make of that people a royal priesthood a kingdom of kings and priests. He designed to lead them forward under the guidance of the everlasting priesthood, the priesthood, after the holy order of the Son of God to lead them forward until they should behold the face of their God and see him for themselves. But they would not. They hardened their hearts. They could not endure his presence. J.D. 25 290. As mentioned, in this ordinance of the second anointing, the couple are anointed as a king and queen, priest and priestess to the Most High God for time and throughout all eternity. Juve. Instra. 15111. In the Mormon temple, woman is not merely implied, but well defined and named. There the theme of the Song of the New Jerusalem is faithfully rendered in her personality. If man is anointed priest unto God, woman is anointed priestess, if symboled in his heavenly estate as king, she is also symboled as queen. Women of Mormondom, Tullage, page 488. The prophet Joseph attempted to prepare and elevate church members to the point of receiving these higher blessings the fullness of the priesthood. This royal priesthood order of kings and queens was to be part of the kingdom which would last forever. The prophet Joseph said. Those holding the fullness of the Melchizedek priesthood are kings and priests of the Most High God, holding the keys of power and blessings. In fact, that priesthood is a perfect law of theocracy and stands as God to give laws to the people, administering endless lives to the sons and daughters of Adam. TPJS, page 322. And again. The prophet taught further that through the rites of the temple, faithful women would achieve exaltation within the eternal family order, as priestesses and as queens to their husbands, and over their posterity for endless ages of time. This meant that within the home, women shared priesthood rights with their husbands. A priestess is a female priest one who exercises priestly rights and powers by virtue of the priesthood. In this context, a queen is a woman with a political stature and power in the home, within the patriarchal order of the priesthood. The priesthood rights of women pertain to the home, they did not extend in a general way to the church, but within the divine patriarchal order, a woman's ministry in the home was derived from the priesthood, and the functions of teaching, guiding, and directing her family, were priestly acts. Doc. Of the Kingdom, Hiram Andrus, pages 411-412. It has never been the policy of the LDS Church to allow a woman to receive her second anointing, except with her husband. 
it would even be less probable to allow a single woman to ever receive those blessings. This subject was taken up by the First Presidency in a letter dated November 1904. November 4, 1904. Pressed. Thomas R. Bassett. Rexburg, Idaho. Dear Brother. Referring to yours of the first inst. Recommending Sister Harriet B. Roberry for second anointing, we would say that a woman cannot receive those blessings except in connection with her husband. And a man so indifferent to the ordinances of the house of the Lord as to neglect doing his own temple work in his lifetime, although, as you say, he might have done so had he been so inclined, can scarcely be considered worthy of second anointing. And we do not see how you can consistently recommend him to receive those blessings. For these reasons we have withheld your endorsement from the recommends sent by you in favor of Sister Roberry. Your brethren. S. Joseph F. Smith. S. John R. Winder. S. Anthon H. Lund. Historical Department, Confidential Research Files, 1950-1974 LDS Church Archives, January 10, 1905. The rules for a man and a woman to receive their second anointings were generally the same they would both receive them together. James E. Tomage wrote, True, there are certain of the higher ordinances to which an unmarried woman cannot be admitted, but the rule is equally in force as to a bachelor. The House of the Lord, page 94. However, there have been a few exceptions to this rule, as Michael Quinn researched. This requires acknowledgement that Wilfred Woodruff's diary says the following men received the second anointing alone, since their wives had not yet been endowed and were not present. Parley P. Pratt on 21 January 1844, Orson Hyde on 25 January 1844, Orson Pratt on 26 January 1844, and William Clayton on 3 February 1844. Joseph Smith's diaries indicate the same thing. The reference to Clayton is incorrect and arose from his name having appeared immediately after the second anointing for Joseph and Clarissa Young. Clayton's diary shows that he received only the first anointing in 1844, and Heber C. Kimball's diary in December 1845 listed Clayton among the anointed quorum's members who had not yet received their last or second anointing. However, there is no mistake in the second anointing reference to the Pratt brothers and Orson Hyde. Quinn, op. Sit. Page, 397, FTNT. 35. It is rather difficult for a man to be a king, presiding over a kingdom, without a queen. That is the established structure and order that also pertains to the holy priesthood. The following sample quotations illustrate five different cases of couples getting their second anointings. These were quite common in the early years of the church, but in this part of the 20th century, they are enjoyed only by some of the church hierarchy. The summer of 1845 I spent a portion of the time laboring on the Nauvoo Temple and a portion for the support of my family. On the 23rd of December myself and wife Elizabeth received our washing and anointing in the temple, and on the 19th of January, 1846, we were sealed, agreeable to the order of the holy priesthood, for time and for all eternity. On the 22nd of January we received our second anointing, on which day my father and mother also received theirs. W.M. Hyde Autobiography, BYU Library, page 16. In the fall of 1845 I was again taken sick with chills and fever, and was unable to do a day's work for eight months. During this time in the winter of 1845 and 1846, notwithstanding my sickness, I went into the temple in Nauvoo and received my endowments by washing and anointing, and was sealed to my wife Sophia for time and all eternity. And afterwards we were anointed the second time a king and queen in the kingdom of God, Noah Packard Autobiography, Typescript, BYUS Library, page 9. January 11, 1846. I was called on to go to work in the Nauvoo Temple which I did. I assisted in the forenoon, afternoon, and at night I anointed some 70 persons. 26 of us were called upon to go to the temple and be sealed to Brother Heber C. Kimball. The next Friday we were invited to go to Father Kimball's, and we received some good instructions and enjoyed ourselves in a dance, also. The next week we were to work in the temple, and Father Kimball called on me to go home and get my wife and also James Smith and wife to be sealed to our wives. We did this. We were conducted into another department and received our second anointing. This was a source of knowledge to us, and it was a great consolation that we were counted worthy before our Father in heaven to receive that which we did receive. Joseph Hovey Autobiography, BYU Library, page 34. Apostate spirits within were now joining with our enemies outside for the destruction of the priesthood, for the temple was progressing, 
and the devil, striving for empire, began to stir up, in the Mazen Judas, desire for the prophet's blood. The keys of endowments and plural marriage had been given, and some had received their second anointing. Benjamin Johnson, My Life's Review, 1847, page 98. June 22, 1870. Myself with my three wives Susan, Janet, and Margaret and my son James with two teams all started for Salt Lake City and arrived at the city on the second day of July. On the sixth day Susan and myself with my sister Esther M. Lebron went to the endowment house and were baptized and sealed for the following persons. Names listed, Esther was also baptized for Julia and Servina Taft, both my cousins, and were both sealed to me. My wife Susan was baptized and sealed for Charlotte Fuller, Darnie Lyman, Harriet Webster and Lucy Holmes, all sealed to me. July 7, 1870. Myself and three wives all went to the endowment house and received our second anointing under the hand of President Daniel H. Wells. Joel Johnson Autobiography, BYU Collection. After the turn of the century, the second anointing started to gradually fade out, and during the presidency of Heber J. Grant, there were years in which no second anointings were recorded. So, instead of being a nation of kings and queens, very few of the nine million members of the church today have received these ordinations. Is it because not many Latter-day Saints are worthy of these highest ordinations? Has the church hierarchy just kept these sacred ordinances for themselves? Or have they lost the calling and authority to even perform such anointings? Either we are no better than the ancient Israelites who had the higher priesthood taken out of their midst, or many worthy members are being deprived of their proper blessings. Even in 1854 John Taylor pled with the saints. Well, what is it we are engaged in? Is the object of our being, in this life, attained by thinking of nothing else but horses, to look to nothing else but our little interests, our little farmer house, a few cattle, and the like? Is this all we are concerned in, ye Latter-day Saints? And if some of these things do not come smooth and square according to your notions, and if you have made your golden or some other darling idol, and a Moses should come along and break it to pieces and stamp it under his feet, and scatter it abroad, and say, Arise, Israel! And wake from your slumbers do you feel very much grieved? Do you feel as though some dreadful calamity had happened to you? Have you forgot who you are, and what your object is? Have you forgot that you profess to be saints of the Most High God, clothed upon with the Holy Priesthood? Have you forgot that you are aiming to become kings and priests to the Lord, and queens and priestesses to Him? JD 1 372-373. And a few years later, in 1857 and 1858, Elder Taylor again reminded the saints. What are we engaged in? We are engaged in building up the kingdom of God, and many of you have been ordained by the revelations of the Almighty to hold the power and authority of the holy priesthood. Besides this, you have been ordained kings and queens, and priests and priestesses to your Lord, you have been put in possession of principles that all the kings, potentates, and powers upon the earth are entirely ignorant of, they do not understand it. But you have received this from the hands of God. JD 5 190. We are all aiming at celestial glory. Do you know we are? We are talking about it, and we talk about being kings and priests unto the Lord, we talk about being enthroned in the kingdoms of our God, we talk about being queens and priestesses, and we talk, when we get on our high-heeled shoes, about possessing thrones, principalities, power, and dominions in the eternal worlds, when at the same time many of us do not know how to conduct ourselves any better than a donkey does. JD 6 166. Apostle John Taylor's advice is just as appropriate for us today, and particularly applies to those men and women who are continually clamoring for women to be ordained to the priesthood. Righteous LDS endowed and married women already have all the powers and blessings of priesthood that they need. The problem is they don't recognize and magnify what they have. Margaret Toscano, in her article entitled, If Mormon Women Have Had the Priesthood Since 1843, Why Aren't They Using It? answers her own question. Why aren't women using their priesthood? Because they are prevented from doing so by the current policy of the church which many assume to be the will of God without examining the historical evidence or theological assumptions behind this policy. While women do not need and should not ask permission for male leaders to use their priesthood in private ways or accepted venues, it is impossible for them to use it in visible ways or in official capacities without an acknowledgement of women's right to priesthood. Dialogue 27 2, Summer 1994, page 224, 223. George Q. Cannon realized the potential of worthy brothers and sisters in the gospel. 
the genius of the kingdom with which we are associated is to disseminate knowledge through all the ranks of the people and to make every man a prophet and every woman a prophetess, that they may understand the plans and purposes of God. JD 1246. In our day the term queen is tossed around until we have lost the real scope and intent of a true queen. We now have beauty queens, international queens, carnival queens, cotton queens, milk queens, drag queens, queen bees, and even queen for a day. Those we seem to understand and value, but we've lost sight of God's queens. The questions then arise after being anointed a king and a queen, what are their additional responsibilities and callings? Are these just honorary titles, or are they actual offices with specific duties associated thereto? When Heber C. Kimball gave Brigham Young his second anointing, he promised him. Dot 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 thou mayst be enabled to speak the great things of God, and confound all the wisdom of man, and put to naught all who shall raise up to oppose thee, in all countries where thou goest for thou shalt build up the kingdom of God among many people, and in the midst of mighty nations. So thy glory shall be established, and whosoever thou shalt bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven, and whomsoever thou shalt loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven, for there shall be given unto thee crowns, and kingdoms, and dominions. Dot dot dot, Book of Anointings, page 2 to 3. Orson Pratt described the tremendous power of the priesthood of God, and distinguishes between kingly and priestly authority. The priesthood of God is the great, supreme, legal authority that governs the inhabitants of all redeemed and glorified worlds. In it is included all power to create worlds, to ordain fixed and permanent laws for the regulation of the materials and all their varied operations, whether acting as particles, as masses, as worlds, or as clusters of worlds. It is that power that formed the minerals, the vegetables, and the animals and all their infinite varieties which exist upon our globe. It is that authority that reveals laws for the government of intelligent beings that rewards the obedient and punishes the disobedient that ordains principalities, powers, and kingdoms to carry out its righteous administrations throughout all dominions. The kingly authority is not separate and distinct from the priesthood, but merely a branch or portion of the same. The priestly authority is universal, having power over all things, the kingly authority until perfected is limited to the kingdoms placed under its jurisdiction. The former appoints and ordains the latter, but the latter never appoints and ordains the former. The first controls the laws of nature and exercises jurisdiction over the elements, as well as over men, the last controls men only and administers just and righteous laws for their government. Where the two are combined and the individual perfected, he has almighty power both as a king and as a priest, both offices are then merged in one. The distinctions then will be merely in the name and not in the authority. Either as a king or a priest, he will then have power and dominion over all things and reign over all. Both titles, combined, will then not give him any more power than either one singly. It is evident that the distinctions of title are only expressive of the condition of things prior to the glorification and perfection of the persons who hold the priesthood, for when they are perfected, they will have power to act in every branch of authority by virtue of the great and almighty and eternal priesthood which they hold. They can then sway their scepters as kings, rule as princes, minister as apostles, officiate as teachers, or act in the humblest or most exalted capacity. There is no branch of the priesthood so low that they cannot condescend to officiate therein, none so high that they cannot reach forth the arm of power and control the same. The Seer, Pratt, Bowl. 1, Number 10, Page 145. As queen, of course, the wife is by her king's side sharing in all these responsibilities, callings and powers. In the English definition, queen is one who reigns in her own right and is the wife of the reigning monarch. Among the Jews some of the queens received a special recognition and honor. The queen of Sheba was the first woman to receive that title in Bible history. She gives us much reason to respect such qualities in all women. As Herbert Lockyer wrote. The Queen of Sheba was of the Semitic race and not wholly alien from the stock of Abraham. Queens were not unusual in her region, Acts 8:27. Legend has it that she was a ruler of the great kingdom of South Arabia, and that she was renowned for her beauty, wealth and magnificence. Through commercial intercourse the queen came to learn of the wisdom and wealth of Solomon, and was determined to find out for herself the truth of all she had heard. The queen came to Solomon, we are told, to ask him concerning the name of the Lord, and to prove him with hard questions. Such was no idle curiosity, which can be a good master as well as a bad one. In the Quino's case, curiosity was the stepping stone to revelation and higher wisdom. She undertook a long journey, for those times, and at fabulous cost, to sit before Solomon and learn of his wisdom. She felt that no effort was too great or price too high for an introduction to the king's superb wisdom. 
she did not come on a visit of state or to enter into some kind of treaty or even to behold Solomon's magnificence. Her quest was for wisdom and for a fuller knowledge of Solomon's God. See Isaiah 63, 6, 19, 20. With all the pomp and pageantry, culture and commerce the Quino's country represented, she had no need to curry even Solomon's favor. She saw the widening of her mental and spiritual horizon. Does not this queen represent those young women of today with a thirst for higher knowledge and culture, all that is artistically beautiful, and for the poetry of religion? Receptive to wisdom, they become wise. Their lives are enriched by contact with intellectual superiority, reading and questioning. Would that more could be found following the Queen of Sheba in her quest? All the Kings and Queens of the Bible, Lockyer, Zondervan Publishing, pages 211, 212, 213. Today we seem to have lost sight of the most important blessings that God has prepared for his people. We are immersed in the temporal jungles of Babylon, searching for ridiculous honors and titles among the Gentiles, instead of those esteemed offices and callings of the priesthood. We want the honors of prominent men in the business world instead of kings and queens in the kingdom of God. Our failure with the priesthood and its higher ordinations is even greater than that of ancient Israel. Looking to the fruition of the divine program in eternity, Brigham Young promised, Doc. Of the kingdom, Andrus, page 411. Now, brethren, the man that honors his priesthood, the woman that honors her priesthood, will receive an everlasting inheritance in the kingdom of God, but it will not be until this earth is purified and sanctified and ready to be offered up to the Father. But we can go to work now and live as near as we can like the family of heaven, that we may secure to ourselves the blessings of heaven and of earth, of time and of eternity, and life everlasting in the presence of the Father and the Son. This is what we want to do. Remember it, brethren and sisters, and try to live worthy of the vocation of your high calling. You are called to be saints just think of and realize it, for the greatest honor and privilege that can be conferred upon a human being is to have the privilege of being a saint. The honor of the kings and queens of the earth fades into insignificance when compared with the title of a saint. You may possess earthly power and rule with an iron hand, but that power is nothing, it will soon be broken and pass away but the power of those who live and honor the priesthood will increase forever and ever. J.D. 17 119-120. The endowment, then, is a passport to enable you to walk back into the presence of the Father, B.Y., by the use of certain keys, signs and tokens. The blessings and promises of both the first endowment and the second anointing are available for both worthy men and women alike. Chapter 9. They shall be one flesh. Vocal music reaches its greatest power and beauty in the harmonious blending of more than one voice. The energy, power and usefulness of electricity results from the combination of both the negative and the positive wires. Scissors are useless without both halves. So must men and women be spiritually united to receive the fullness of priesthood blessings and promises. The instruction to be one flesh was given to mankind at the beginning of this world. And Adam said, This I know now is bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Gen. 229-30, IV. It should be understood that being one in flesh has to do with the physical union and does not mean necessarily one in spirit, purpose or principle, although that is certainly the ideal. Paul explained to the Corinthians. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. I Cor. 6 15-17. When a woman is sealed to a man by priesthood authority, she should then become one with him in every aspect. Not just physically, but spiritually, emotionally, intellectually, etc. She then shares his life, his name, his glory, and his priesthood. Birthright to the priesthood. Neither man nor woman is born with the priesthood, although they can come into mortality with the right to it, or as heirs to it, because of lineage. What is meant by the command in Isaiah, 52 d chapter, first verse, which saith, Put on thy strength, O Zion and what people had Isaiah reference to? He had reference to those whom God should call in the last days, who should hold the power of priesthood to bring again Zion, and the redemption of Israel, and to put on her strength is to put on the authority of the priesthood, which she, Zion, has a right to by lineage. DNC 113 7-8. The birthright to the priesthood, however, is not the priesthood itself, but a right to have it. 
Abraham learned that he was of the lineage which had a right to the priesthood and went to Melchizedek telling him of that birthright, thereupon Melchizedek conferred the priesthood upon Abraham. And when he left, he said, now I have a priesthood. TPJS, page 323, DHC 5555. Michael Quinn explains this further. In February 1844 State Patriarch John Smith told an LDS woman that she had a right to priesthood from her birth. Thou art of the blood of Abraham through the loins of Manasseh and lawful heir to the priesthood he said to Louisa C. Jackson. She was not among the elite Mormon women who received the endowment before the opening of the Nauvoo Temple in December 1845. Referring to her eventual sealing and second anointing, the patriarch added that this woman shall possess a priesthood in common with thy companion. Louisa's blessing showed that any Mormon woman had a birthright to priesthood which depended on no man. John Smith's Patriarchal Blessing, February 6, 1844, RLDS Archives, as quoted in Quinn's article in Women and Authority, page 369. This passage, along with Doctrine and Covenants 113, shows us that the right to enjoy the authority of the priesthood is passed down through those men and women who are of the chosen lineage. In connection with their husbands. Throughout the writings of Mormonism we find the message reiterated that women share the priesthood with their husbands. This was reinforced as the official church position by John Taylor in 1880, as described and verified by Linda Newell in her article, The Historical Relationship of Mormon Women and Priesthood. Sarah Granger Kimball, whose idea it was to organize the women of Nauvoo, had used the priesthood structure as a pattern for the Relief Society in her ward, complete with deaconesses and teachers. Sarah M. Kimball, 15th Ward R.S. Minutes, 1868, LDS Archives, however, John Taylor, who had originally ordained those first officers in March 1842, explained that some of the sisters had thought that these sisters mentioned were, in this ordination, ordained to the priesthood. But it is not the calling of these sisters to hold the priesthood, only in connection with their husbands, they being one with their husbands. J.D. 21 367 68, this 1880 statement has stood as the official interpretation. Newell, as quoted in Women and Authority, Hanks, page 29. The following several references samples from 1842 to 1896 give further support to this position. 1842. On the occasion of the organization of the Relief Society, April 1842, by the Prophet Joseph Smith at Nauvoo, I, John Taylor, was present. Sister Emma Smith was elected president and sisters Elizabeth Ann Whitney and Sarah M. Cleveland her counselors. The ordination then given did not mean the conferring of the priesthood upon those sisters, yet the sisters hold a portion of the priesthood in connection with their husbands. Sisters Eliza R. Snow and Bathsheba W. Smith stated that they so understood it in Nauvoo and have looked upon it always in that light. The Woman's Exponent 953, September 1, 1880. 1844. You shall be blessed in common with your husband, and shall receive all the blessings of the priesthood that are sealed upon his head, even the seal of the covenant. Hiram Smith's Patriarchal Blessing to Sarah Forstner Zundel, Jan. 31, 1844, Record of the Ancestry and Descendants of John Jacob Zundel, page 63, LDS Church Library. 1845. The Father commissioned him to preach the gospel to them and show them the plan by which they could be brought up in the resurrection and prepare themselves for higher glories. This is the way that he spent the time, and this is the way that every person who holds the priesthood will spend the time that intervenes between his death and his resurrection. The spirits of men are not all that will be employed in this delightful task, but you, too, my sisters, will take a part therein for you will hold a portion of the priesthood with your husbands, and you will thus do a work, as well as they. That will augment that glory which you will enjoy after your resurrection. Orson Pratt, at the funeral of Mrs. Carolyn Smith, June 1, 1845, T and S 6 920. SISTERS. Have no right to meddle in the affairs of the kingdom of God. They never can hold the priesthood apart from their husbands. Brigham Young, 70s Record, March 9, 1845. 1846. Here is a blessing given by Patriarch John Smith to Emily Jacob in 1846. I place my hands upon thy head in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and seal upon thee the priesthood, with all the blessings of the new and everlasting covenant, which was sealed upon the children of Joseph. For this is thy lineage, the same as thy companion. Thou hast a right to all the blessings which are sealed upon his head, for a woman can have but little power in the priesthood without a man. City of Joseph, The Record of Norton Jacob, pages 16-17, to 17, January 26, 1846. 
1856. I accordingly asked Mr. Heber C. Kimball if women had a right to wash and anoint the sick for the recovery of their health, or is it mockery in them to do so? He replied inasmuch as they are obedient to their husbands, they have a right to administer in that way in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, but not by authority of the priesthood invested in them, for that authority is not given to women. He also said they might administer by the authority given to their husbands inasmuch as they were one with their husbands. Mary Ellen Abel Kimball Diary, 2 March 1856, LDS Archives. In another blessing given by Alicia Graves to Lucy Flake, again the necessity of holding the priesthood in order to do temple work is indicated. Thou art a royal heir to all the blessings, privileges and powers which pertain to the holy priesthood according to thy sex. Which thou shalt receive in due time that thou mayst be able to accomplish thy work in behalf of thy progenitors. Thou shalt be connected with a man of God, through whom thou shalt receive the priesthood, exaltation, power and eternal glory, become a mother in Israel. Dot dot dot. Be anointed a queen and priestess unto the Most High God, receive thy crown, dominion, power and eternal increase, thy inheritance with thy benefactor in Zion. Life of Lucy Hannah White Flake pages 4-5, blessing given by Alicia H. Graves, November 4, 1856. 1857. Tell about loving God and his people. If you do not love the man that leads you, you do not love that being who confers all the blessings and privileges we enjoy. Tell about loving God, and not love the men that lead you. Get out with your nonsense. Will that apply to the elders? Yes, and to the seventies, the high priests, bishops, teachers, and all men. Any further? Yes, it applies to you ladies, in your family capacity. You have not any priesthood, only in connection with your husbands. You suppose that you receive the priesthood when you receive your endowments, but the priesthood is on your husbands. Can you honor God and the priesthood, and abuse your husbands like the devil? How can you honor the priesthood, except you honor the man you are connected with? Heber C. Kimball, J.D. 531, July 12, 1857. Some of you ladies, that go abroad from house to house, blessing the sick, having your little circles of women come together, why are you troubling yourselves to bless and lay your hands on women, and prophecy on them, if you do not believe the principle? You make yourselves fools to say that that same power should not be on the man that has got the priesthood, and with sisters that have not got any, only what they hold in connection with their husbands. Heber C. Kimball, J.D. 5 177, August 23, 1857. I do not care so much about the women obeying as I do the men. I am not talking about them, but you, elders of Israel, that have the priesthood. Women have not a particle of priesthood, only what they hold in connection with their husbands, neither have the men, except that which they hold in connection with those who hold the keys of the kingdom at headquarters. Heber C. Kimball, J.D. 667, November 22, 1857. 1879. Our sisters are engaged with us in trying to do a good work. Shall we despise them in their labors? No. Who are they? Part of ourselves. Do they hold a priesthood? Yes, in connection with their husbands and they are one with their husbands, but the husband is the head. John Taylor, J.D. 2359, November 30, 1879. 1880. At that meeting the prophet called Sister Emma to be an elect lady. That means that she was called to a certain work, and that was in fulfillment of a certain revelation concerning her. She was elected to preside over the Relief Society, and she was ordained to expound the scriptures. In compliance with Brother Joseph's request, I set her apart, and also ordained Sister Whitney, wife of Bishop Newell K. Whitney, and Sister Cleveland, wife of Judge Cleveland, to be her counselors. Some of the sisters have thought that these sisters mentioned were, in this ordination, ordained to the priesthood. And for the information of all interested in this subject I will say, it is not the calling of these sisters to hold the priesthood, only in connection with their husbands, they being one with their husbands. John Taylor, J.D. 21 367 68. 1887 The father of a family is the patriarch, he holds in his hands the keys of blessing for every member of his family, and is their head. His wives, be they few or many, are given to him, and here it is that the man is not without the woman, that through them he may not only perpetuate his name and continue his generation, but that through them the priesthood may be continued also. For sorrowful indeed is the condition of that family which is without a man holding the priesthood to stand before the Lord in their behalf. As we have said, while the man holds the keys independently, what power his wives have is in him and not in themselves alone. Let us illustrate. The revelator John talks of our becoming kings and priests. 
when this time arrives, a man then becomes a king and a priest to God, but a woman becomes a queen and priestess to her husband. And though a man may have a thousand, yet each woman holds this right independent of any other woman, when the blessing is conferred upon her, but no woman can receive this blessing, unless she is allied to a man who has attained to this power. We repeat, the man can receive this blessing also independently, whereas the woman receives it because of and through her husband. Her glory, her exaltation, and all the blessings pertaining to eternal lives, will also come through this channel. But as woman, through the power of the gospel, can rise above that part of the curse pertaining to her fallen state which says, thy desire shall be to thy husband, so will she gradually merge into that more pleasing condition, which will bring to her a fullness of joy forevermore, possessing, as she will, all that power, authority and rule that belongs to her in connection with, and not separate from her husband. Joseph E. Taylor, Day. Eden. News, December 24, 1887. 1888. Now, I ask you. Is it possible that we have the holy priesthood and our wives have none of it? Do you not see, by what I have read, that Joseph desired to confer these keys of power upon them in connection with their husbands? I hold that a faithful wife has certain blessings, powers and rights, and is made partaker of certain gifts and blessings and promises with her husband, which she cannot be deprived of, except by transgression of the holy order of God. Franklin D. Richards, Cole. Dis. 519, July 19, 1888. 1896. In 1889 a monthly magazine for women was published for the Young Ladies Mutual Improvement Association. It was established by Brigham Young's daughter, Susa Young Gates, and in 1896, an article appeared saying that dot 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 the 70s wife bears the priesthood of the 70 in connection with her husband and shares in its responsibilities. Young Women's JRNL. 7398. Church position changes. Around the turn of the century, this understanding of women holding priesthood in connection with their husbands began to fade away, along with many other doctrines. Note the contradiction made by Joseph F. Smith in 1907. Does a wife hold the priesthood with her husband, and may she lay hands on the sick with him, with authority? A wife does not hold the priesthood with her husband, but she enjoys the benefits thereof with him, and as she is requested to lay hands on the sick with him, or with any other officer holding the Melchizedek priesthood, she may do so with perfect propriety. It is no uncommon thing for a man and wife unitedly to administer to their children. Doc. Of Sal. 3122, era 10308. Also in 1907, over the signatures of Joseph F. Smith and his two counselors, an address to the world was publicized wherein it clearly stated, We affirm that through the ministration of immortal personages, the holy priesthood has been conferred upon men in the present age, and that under this divine authority, the Church of Christ has been organized. Mess. A first press. 4144-45. However, it is interesting to note that John A. Witzow was still teaching in 1915. Women enjoy all the endowments and blessings of the priesthood in connection with their husbands. The family is the basis of society on earth, and as there must be organization among intelligent beings, someone must be spokesman for the family. In the family, the man is the spokesman and presiding authority, and, therefore, the priesthood is bestowed upon him. Rational Theology, Witzow, 1st ed. 1915, page 97. But in 1921 Charles W. Penrose of the First Presidency stated. Sisters have said to me sometimes, but, I hold the priesthood with my husband. Well I asked, what office do you hold in the priesthood? Then they could not say much more. The sisters are not ordained to any office in the priesthood, and there is authority in the church which they cannot exercise. It does not belong to them, they cannot do that properly any more than they can change themselves into a man. Conf. Rept. April 1921, page 198. And the same general conference, Roger Clausen explained. The priesthood is not received, or held or exercised in any degree, by the women of the church, but, nevertheless, the women of the church enjoy the blessings of the priesthood through their husbands. This emphasizes very strongly the importance of marriage. Every woman in the church, of mature age and worthiness, who is ambitious to attain to exaltation and glory hereafter should be married, should be sealed to a man for time and all eternity. And we trust that the young women of the church as well as the young men of the church realize the responsibility of this important ordinance. Conf. Rept. April 1921, page 24. The Heber J. Grant presidency continued the trend in 1922. 
women, not being heirs to the priesthood except as they enjoy and participate in its blessings through their husbands, are not identified with the priesthood quorums and consequently do not receive the religious instruction and training imparted at quorum meetings. Mess. Of First Press. 5217. Again, in 1926, this same position was reiterated in an interesting pamphlet printed by the Deseret News Press. Women do not hold the priesthood, but they do share equally in the blessings and gifts bestowed on the priesthood in temple courts, in civic, social and domestic life. The man is not without the woman in the Lord, nor the woman without the man. So said Paul, and so taught Joseph Smith. Office and priesthood carry heavy responsibilities requiring constant labor and time. No woman could safely carry the triple burden of wifehood, motherhood, and at the same time function in priestly orders. Yet her creative home labor rang side by side, in earthly and heavenly importance, with her husband's priestly responsibilities. His is the marketplace hers at the hearthstone. Women of the backquote M-O-R-M-O-N apostrophe church. Susie Young Gates and Lee D. Witzow, page 5. The question might well be asked at this point, how can a man, then, be expected to carry the triple burden of husbandhood, fatherhood, and still function in priestly orders? This line of reasoning seems quite shallow. In 1952 Stephen L. Richards, first counselor in the First Presidency, reaffirmed that. A woman does not hold the priesthood, but she shares it with her husband, and she is the immediate beneficiary of many of its great blessings. When she unites in marriage with a man of the priesthood in one of the temples of the kingdom, the blessings pronounced upon her are of equal import to those given her husband, and these blessings are to be realized only through the enduring compact of the marriage. Conf. Rept. October 1952, page 99. A 1956 conference talk by J. Reuben Clark Jr. expresses his belief that women did not receive priesthood. I have always thought that there was in this an indication of the priesthood status of women, because of the punishment which apparently was inflicted upon Aaron. Which differed from the punishment which was inflicted upon Miriam that, here was an indication that women did not receive the priesthood, and certainly so far as we know, women have not had the priesthood. Miriam's punishment may have covered her seeming claim that she had a right to priesthood powers. Conf. Rept. October 1956, page 85. A discussion on the history of any gospel subject would be incomplete without comments from Bruce R. McConkie. There is no such thing in the true church as a high priestess. Where this office is found in a church, it is an unauthorized and apostate innovation. Women do not hold the priesthood. More. Doc. Page 355. Women do not have the priesthood conferred upon them and are not ordained to offices therein, but they are entitled to all priesthood blessings. Those women who go on to their exaltation, ruling and reigning with husbands who are kings and priests, will themselves be queens and priestesses. They will hold positions of power, authority, and preferment in eternity. More. Doc. Page 594. And in 1963 William J. Critchlow presented his views in General Conference. Priesthood is for men only it is not conferred upon women. The sisters may be set apart as officers in the priesthood auxiliaries, but they are never ordained to office in the priesthood. They do not share the priesthood with their husbands, fathers, or sons. They do share the blessings of the priesthood with their husbands, fathers, or sons. They do share the blessings with their husbands, sealed in a temple, they go along hand in hand with them toward exaltation. Finally reigning as queens and priestesses with their husbands who become kings and priests. D&C 9441, infrequently a sister asks, why can't we, sisters, hold the priesthood? My answer. If and when he whose business priesthood is wants you to hold it, he will let his prophet know. Until then there is nothing we can do about it. Conf. Rept. October 1963, page 29. While these gentlemen do have a technical point that women do not have the Melchizedek priesthood conferred upon them, these brethren seem to enjoy putting women in a subordinate role to men whereas before the turn of the century, women had achieved a little higher station. Where once it was taught that women held the priesthood in conjunction with their husbands, this was changed to women sharing only the blessings of the priesthood in conjunction with their husbands. When the church changes its eternal doctrines, ordinances and laws, such as their stand on woman and the priesthood, it can mean one of two things. Either they were in error in the past and have repented, or their origins were correct, and new changes are making them go astray. During the same month in which the church made the official declaration for blacks to receive the priesthood, Spencer Kimball also stated, we pray to God to reveal his mind, and we always will, but we don't expect any revelation regarding women and the priesthood. 
Kimball says no women in priesthood, SL Tribune, June 13, 1978, D1. President Kimball had access to all the historical and doctrinal records of the church, which stated that black men should not receive the priesthood, but he tried to give it to them anyway. Then with access to similar records stating that women already hold the priesthood with their husbands, he believed it would take a special revelation for that to occur, but he doesn't expect to receive one. Here is a man who tried to give priesthood where it shouldn't be given, and refused to acknowledge priesthood where it already is. A recent article about Mitt Romney, George Romney's son, who is the 1994 Mormon Republican senatorial candidate in Massachusetts, referred to the LDS church stand of not allowing women to hold priesthood. It was reported. Mitt Romney would not comment on the Mormon Church's policy of barring women from the priesthood. Has Senator Kennedy stood up to the Pope and said? Backquote it apostrophe s just not right. We need women priests. If he has, I will listen. I do not consider it my place as a member of my church to fly out to Salt Lake City and say. Backquote why oh you who are people I believe in and trust are wrong out here. Let me tell you how you should run your church. You should have women in the priesthood, Romney said. Late last year, Romney ordered the removal of a woman from the post of Sunday school president after higher church officials in Salt Lake City said the post should be held only by men. Romney said he only was following orders and having the woman removed. He also said he gave the title to a man but allowed the woman to retain the real responsibilities and do the work. SL Tribune, front page, September 8, 1994. The last two paragraphs of this article just add fuel to the LDS feminist fire. The question continues to be asked in Mormon and non-Mormon circles. Will such media coverage and direct or indirect pressure from an increasing number of LDS members result in a change in the current LDS church position regarding women in the priesthood? Women who do not marry a priesthood holder place themselves under certain gospel restrictions. For example, John A. Witso stated. Women married to non-members of the church should not receive their temple endowments. PRST. And CH. Governor, page 343. It is obvious then that a woman can hold or share no greater priesthood than that which her husband possesses. If he has obtained only the Aaronic priesthood, then she is restricted to that same power and authority. Chapter 10. Priesthood. Privileges, blessings and gifts. Gifts of the priesthood. According to Joseph Smith, the sisters would come in possession of the privileges, blessings and gifts of the priesthood, and that signs should follow them. DHC 4602, Edward Tullidge beautifully describes some of these great gifts and privileges of righteous LDS sisters who share in this priesthood authority. The sisters were quite as familiar with angelic visitors as the apostles. They were in fact the best mediums of this spiritual work. They were the cloud of witnesses. Their Pentecosts of spiritual gifts were of frequent occurrence. The sisters were also apostolic in a priestly sense. They partook of the priesthood equally with the men. They, too, held the keys of the administration of angels. Woman also soon became high priestess and prophetess. She was this officially. The constitution of the church acknowledged her divine mission to administer for the regeneration of the race. The genius of a patriarchal priesthood naturally made her the apostolic help meet for man. If you saw her not in the pulpit teaching the congregation, yet was she to be found in the temple, administering for the living and the dead. Even in the Holy of Holies she was met. As a high priest is she blessed with the laying on of hands. As a prophet is she oracled in holy places. As an endowment giver she was a mason, of the Hebraic order, whose grand master is the God of Israel, and whose anointer is the Holy Ghost. She held the keys of the administration of angels and of the working of miracles, and of the sealings pertaining to the heavens and the earth. Never before was woman so much as she is in this Mormon dispensation. Women of Mormondom, Tullidge, pages 22 to 23. Tullidge goes on to give an example of how some Relief Society sisters exercised the power of their priesthood. It should be recorded, as unique in history, that the laying of the cornerstone of this building was performed by the ladies. The ceremony, being unostentatiously performed, was followed by appropriate speech-making on the part of the presiding officer of the society, Mrs. S. N. Kimball, Eliza R. Snow, and others, each in turn mounting the cornerstone for a rostrum, and each winning deserved applause from the assembled thousands. Ibid. Page 491. As one of the most outspoken supporters of the position that women held the priesthood in the early days of the Restoration, Edward Tullidge explained. The Mormon women, as well as men, hold the priesthood. To all that man attains, in celestial exaltation and glory, woman attains. She is his partner in estate and office. 
Ibid. Page 487. Then regarding the second anointing, Tullage continued. In the Mormon temple, woman is not merely implied, but well defined and named. There the theme of the Song of the New Jerusalem is faithfully rendered in her personality. If man is anointed priest unto God, woman is anointed priestess, if symboled in his heavenly estate as king, she is also symboled as queen. Ibid. Page 488. In 1899 an interesting example of women giving blessings is recorded in the diaries of L. John Nuttall. Bro. Meeser dictated and I wrote a report to the SS board, Sister Wolf and Counselors Hammond and June E. Bates. Sisters Rhoda Hammond and several other sisters called and we conversed on relief society matters. I explained many things to them and they were much pleased, after which Sister Elizabeth Hammond said she felt the same spirit which was upon her at the meeting last night when she wanted to bless me. She arose and placed her hands on bro. Meeser's head and blessed him, then on my head and blessed me, then on Sister Wolf and blessed her, also blessed three other of the sisters and Sister Zena Card. This was done in tongues Sister Zena Y. Card arose and laying her hands on our heads interpreted these bless things. A good feeling was present. August 7, 1899. What reaction would there be if such a thing occurred today? What would church leaders say if they found out a woman gave a blessing to a man? What would the leaders say if some women spoke or sang in tongues? Certainly there would not be a good feeling among them. Some male priesthood holders have thought that they are the only ones of their household entitled to receive revelation. They sneered the idea of women receiving it, but Orson Pratt explained that it was common anciently for women to enjoy this spiritual gift. The Lord used to give revelation not only to the head of a family, but also to a man's wives. Read, for instance, what the Lord revealed to the wives of Jacob, how he used to reveal a great many things to Rachel, a great many things to Lee, a great many things to Bilhah, and a great many things to Zilpah. These four wives were revelators, they were prophetesses, they were individuals that could inquire of the Lord and obtain an answer from him, and we have their revelations recorded in the scriptures. We call their revelations the word of God to them. What a benefit it would be for a man who had three or four or half a dozen wives, who could receive the word of the Lord in relation to their several duties, how calculated it would be to produce peace and union and salvation in the family and household. J.D. 2067. When someone is baptized and confirmed a member of the church, he or she is promised the gift of the Holy Ghost. Both men and women can and should enjoy the blessings and gifts resulting therefrom, as the prophet Joseph Smith said. We believe in the gift of the Holy Ghost being enjoyed now, as much as it was in the Apostles' days, we also believe in prophecy, in tongues, in visions, and in revelations, in gifts, and in healings, and that these things cannot be enjoyed without the gift of the Holy Ghost. We believe that the Holy Ghost is imparted by the laying on of hands of those in authority, and that the gift of tongues, and also the gift of prophecy, are gifts of the Spirit, and are obtained through that medium. TPJS, page 243. Heber C. Kimball also mentioned that these gifts of the Holy Ghost were certainly not restricted to just male members. When the Holy Ghost dwells in us, it will enable us to discern between right and wrong, will show us things to come, and bring things to our remembrance, and will make every one of this people prophets and prophetesses of God. J.D. 4 119. Gift of Healing. One of the most noted and frequently exercised spiritual gifts among women in the church has been the gift of healing. There have been a few individuals, however, that refused to grant women that privilege. In 1884 the following comments were recorded by a counselor in the Salt Lake State Presidency. The state counselor next expressed his own discomfort with sisters who claim they have been blessed and set apart by the authority of God to anoint the sick of their own sex. He emphasized that each LDS woman holds priesthood in connection with her husband, but not separate from him. He concluded with a tirade against the vain ambition and grave mistakes some of our sisters have made in seeking to raise herself sick to inequality with men in all things. Joseph E. Taylor, S.L. Stake Historical Minutes, Jan. 30, 1884, LDS Archives, as quoted in Michael Quinn's article in Women and Authority, page 379. He must not have been familiar with Joseph Smith's instructions that it was permissible for women to perform healing blessings as supported by the following. Respecting females administering for the healing of the sick, he, Joseph Smith, further remarked, there could be no evil in it, if God gave his sanction by healing, that there could be no more sin in any female laying hands on and praying for the sick, than in wetting the face with water. It is no sin for anybody to administer that has faith, or if the sick have faith to be healed by their administration, DHC 4604. And again, 
Joseph Smith made a point of the fact that faithful women, as well as men, could enjoy the spiritual gifts and powers of the gospel and exercise spiritual gifts to bless and benefit others. In speaking to the Female Relief Society at Nauvoo, he noted that some foolish things were being circulated against some sisters not doing right by laying hands on the sick. He countered by citing the promise of Jesus in Mark 16 16-18 that signs and gifts were to follow those who believed, then observed. No matter who believeth, these signs, such as healing the sick, casting out devils, etc., should follow all that believed, whether male or female. DHC 4603, Doc of the Kingdom, Andrus, page 411. The above sentiments by the Prophet Joseph are related in more detail by press. Franklin D. Richards, in his July 19, 1888, Discourse to the Relief Society in Ogden, Utah. He, Joseph Smith, said, in relation to the females administering to the sick, that there could be no more wrong in it than in performing any other ordinance of the church, if the Lord gave his sanction, by healing the sick under the hands of the sisters. He, J.S., said the reason of these remarks being made was that some little foolish things were circulating in the society against some sisters not doing right and laying hands on the sick. Said if the people had common sympathies they would rejoice that the sick could be healed, that the time had not been before that these things could be in their proper order, that the church is not fully organized in its proper order and cannot be until the temple is completed. Where places will be provided for the administration of the ordinances of the priesthood. President Joseph Smith then gave instruction respecting the propriety of females administering to the sick by the prayer of faith and laying on of hands or the anointing with oil, and said it was according to revelation that the sick should be nursed with herbs and mild food, and not by the hand of an enemy. Who are better qualified to administer than our faithful and zealous sisters whose hearts are full of faith, tenderness, sympathy, and compassion? No one. Said he was never placed in similar circumstances before and never had given the same instruction and closed his instructions by expressing his heartfelt satisfaction in improving this opportunity. I wish all the sisters were so faithful that they were healers of the sick through the power of God. Cole. Dis. 518-19. Brigham Young also encouraged the sisters to administer to the sick especially to their own children. It is the privilege of a mother to have faith and to administer to her child, this she can do herself as well as sending for the elders to have the benefit of their faith. JD 13 155. One of the first examples in our dispensation of a woman's gift of healing was that of Sarah S. Levitt, who healed her daughter, Louisa, of a lengthy illness. I prayed earnestly to the Lord to let us know what we should do. There was an angel stood by my bed to answer my prayer. He told me to call Louisa up and lay my hands upon her head in the name of Jesus Christ and administer to her, and she should recover. I awakened my husband, who lay by my side, and told him to get up, make a fire, and get Louisa up. She would hear to him sooner than to me. To tell her that an angel had told me to lay my hands upon her head in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and administer to her in his name, and she should recover. She was perfectly ignorant of Mormonism, all she had ever heard about it was in Kirtland, what few days we stayed there and what we had told her. Her mind was weak, indeed, but she got up and I administered to her in faith, having the gift from the Lord. It was about midnight when this was done, and she began to recover from that time and was soon up and about, and the honor, praise and glory be to God and the Lamb. Note. Sarah's husband was apparently not a member of the church at this time. Taken from Autobiographies of Mormon Pioneer Women, Vol. 1, pages 16-17. Mary Ellen Abel Kimball, a wife of Heber C. Kimball, also had a healing experience where on March 2, 1857, she washed and anointed a sick woman, Susanna, who immediately felt better. After returning home, she recorded in her journal. I thought of the instructions I had received from time to time that the priesthood was not bestowed upon women. I accordingly asked Mr. Heber C. Kimball if women had a right to wash and anoint the sick for the recovery of their health, or is it a mockery in them to do so? He replied inasmuch as they are obedient to their husbands, they have a right to administer in that way in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, but not by authority of the priesthood invested in them, for that authority is not given to women. He also said they might administer by the authority given to their husbands inasmuch as they were one with their husband. Journal of Mary Ellen Kimball, Pub by Pioneer Press, 1994, page 47. Many such healings were experienced by the early LDS sisters, and they were encouraged by the leading brethren. John Taylor said. When your husbands are absent, you sisters should ask Godot's blessing that he should lead you in the paths of life, 
And further, you should lay hands on your sick children and rebuke diseases in faith and power, and God will be near you. Dot 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 Woman's Exponent 5 148 49. Apostle Ezra T. Benson told the saints in 1852. The priests in Christendom warn their flocks not to believe in Mormonism, and yet you sisters have power to heal the sick by the laying on of hands, which they cannot do. Mill. Star 15 130. Thirteen years later, Elder Benson is reported to have encouraged ordained women in their gift of healing. The year before, 1865, in Cache Valley, Apostle Ezra T. Benson had called on women who had been ordained and held the power to rebuke diseases to do so, and urged all the women to gain the same power by exercising faith. The record does not specify who the ordained women were or who ordained them, implying that they were well known in the community. Newell, Op. Sit. Page 28 of Women and Authority. Linda Newell mentions an interesting difference of opinion that developed after 1855. Two differing points of view were now in print. Eliza Snow in the First Presidency agreed that the Relief Society could perform healings for women and for family. However, the First Presidency implied that the ordinance should be limited to the woman's immediate family. In contrast Eliza Snow said nothing of limiting administrations to the family and that only women who had been endowed might officiate. Newell, Op. Sit. Pages 30-31 of Women and Authority. Sister Eliza R. Snow addressed another question. Is it necessary for sisters to be set apart to officiate in the sacred ordinances of washing, anointing, and laying on of hands and administering to the sick? Her answer. Any and all sisters who honor their holy endowments not only have the right, but should feel it a duty whenever called upon to administer to our sisters in these ordinances, which God has graciously committed to his daughters as well as to his sons. Woman's Exponent 1361, September 15, 1884. Emmeline B. Wells, who was soon to be president of the Relief Society, asked Wilfred Woodruff about washings and anointings. He answered that. Dot 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 the ordinance of washing and anointing is one that should only be administered in temples or other holy places, which are dedicated to the purpose of giving endowments to the saints. Dot 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 washing and anointing sisters who are approaching their confinement dot 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 is not, strictly speaking, an ordinance unless it be done under the direction of the priesthood and in connection with the ordinance of laying on of hands for the restoration of the sick. There is no impropriety in sisters washing and anointing their sisters in this way dot dot dot, but it should be understood that they do this, not as members of the priesthood, but as members of the church, exercising faith for and asking the blessings of the Lord upon their sisters, just as they and every member of the church might do in behalf of the members of their families. Correspondence of the First Presidency, LDS Archives, April 27, 1888. President Woodruff distinguished between temple washings and anointings, the women's practice of washing and anointing, and the priesthood ordinance of anointing in connection with healing. Still this confirmed that the same act was performed and very nearly the same words used in the temple and outside the temple by women and by men administering to women. Newell, Op. Sit. Page 31 of Women and Authority. Nevertheless, women were cautioned in their use of this healing gift and power, as Angus Cannon warned in 1878. The sisters have a right to anoint the sick and pray the Father to heal them and to exercise that faith that will prevail with God, but women must be careful how they use the authority of the priesthood in administering to the sick. Woman's Exponent 1361, September 15, 1884. But just because a woman may have this gift and power of healing, it gives her no right to criticize her husband. Heber C. Kimball warned. Some of you, ladies, that go abroad from house to house, blessing the sick, having your little circles of women come together, why are you troubling yourselves to bless and lay your hands on women and prophecy on them if you do not believe the principle? You make yourselves fools to say that that same power should not be on the man that has got the priesthood and with sisters that have not got any, only what they hold in connection with their husbands. We can tell what will come to pass, and one of you can talk in tongues and pour out your souls to God, and then one interpret, that is the course you take, and it is all right, go ahead, and God bless you and multiply blessings on you. But do not go round tattling about your husbands and talking against the priesthood you are connected to. I do not say many of you do it, but you that do it are poor, miserable skunks. JD 5 176 77. Linda Newell relates how church acceptance of women's healing authority started to decline after the turn of the century. 
Despite growing ambiguity as the 19th century closed, the leading sisters had successfully maintained a right to exercise the gift of blessing and had been supported by the church hierarchy. The 20th century would see a definite shift. Louisa Lula Green Richards, former editor of Women's Exponent, wrote a somewhat terse letter to President Lorenzo Snow on 9 April 1901, concerning an article she had read in the Deseret News. It had stated, Priest, teacher or deacon may administer to the sick, and so may a member, male or female, but neither of them conceal the anointing and blessing, because the authority to do that is vested in the priesthood, after the order of Melchizedek. Lilla wrote. If the information given in the answer is absolutely correct, then myself and thousands of other members of the church have been misinstructed and are laboring under a very serious mistake, which certainly should be authoritatively corrected. Sister Liza R. Snow Smith, from the Prophet Joseph Smith, her husband, taught the sisters in her day that a very important part of the sacred ordinance of administering to the sick was the sealing of the anointing and blessings and should never be omitted. And we follow the pattern she gave us continually. We do not zeal in the authority of the priesthood, but in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Letter in LDS Archives, Newell, Op. Sit. Pages 31 to 32 of Women and Authority. The trend continued, and Apostle Joseph Fielding Smith stated. The brethren do not consider it necessary or wise for the women of the Relief Society to wash and anoint women who are sick. The Lord has given us directions in matters of this kind, we are to call in the elders, and they are to anoint with oil on the head and bless by the laying on of hands. The church teaches that a woman may lay on hands upon the head of a sick child and ask the Lord to bless it, in the case when those holding the priesthood cannot be present. A man might under such conditions invite his wife to lay on hands with him in blessing their sick child. This would be merely to exercise her faith and not because of any inherent right to lay on hands. A woman would have no authority to anoint or seal a blessing and where elders can be called in, that would be the proper way to have an administration performed. Doc. Sal. 3178. In 1936 Joseph Fielding Smith wrote to Relief Society President Bell Spafford and her counselors. While the authorities of the church have ruled that it is permissible, under certain conditions and with the approval of the priesthood, for sisters to wash and anoint other sisters, yet they feel that it is far better for us to follow the plan the Lord has given us and send for the elders of the church to come and administer to the sick and afflicted. Mess. A first press. 4314. It would certainly be difficult for a sister to say that she did not wish to follow the plan the Lord has given us by asking for administrations from sisters rather than elders. Joseph Fielding Smith officially ended women's blessings where they had not already stopped. Newell, Op. Sit. Pages 40-41 to of Women and Authority. Linda Newell's entire article, The Historical Relationship of Mormon Women and Priesthood Pages 23-48 to of Women and Authority, compiled by Maxine Hanks, is very worthwhile reading. According to Orson Pratt, the true Church of Jesus Christ should have the same organization and the same gifts as it did in ancient times. When I speak of the everlasting gospel, I mean the same one that was preached 1800 years ago, and authority will be given to some of the children of men to preach that everlasting gospel among the nations, and when that shall take place. I have no doubt but what there will be many prophets raised up, because the true Christian church has always been characterized by prophets. There never was a genuine Christian church unless it had prophets and prophetesses, indeed, in ancient times prophets were so numerous in one branch of the Christian church that Paul had to set them in order and send them an epistle and tell them not to all get up and prophesy at once. But that if a thing was revealed to anyone, he was not to get up and declare it while another one was speaking, but he was to wait until the first got through speaking, and then he should prophesy, for, said Paul, the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. That is, when the spirit came upon prophets in ancient times, it did not exercise a supernatural power upon them to force them from their seats to stand up and declare their prophecies the moment they were revealed, but that the spirit that was given to them was subject to them, so that they could stay upon their seats until the first prophets got through prophesying. That was the order of the Christian church when God ever had one upon the earth prophets were very numerous in that church. But by and by the time came when the Christian church apostatized and turned away and began to follow after their own wisdom and the prophets and apostles ceased, so far as the affairs of the Christian church on the earth were concerned. Revelations and visions and the various gifts of the Spirit were also taken away, according to their unbelief and apostasy.
Dot 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 and if you ever see a church rise, calling itself a Christian church, and it is not inspired apostles like those in ancient times, you may know that it is a spurious church, and that it makes pretensions to something that it does not enjoy. If you ever find a church called a Christian church that has no men to foretell future events, you may know, at once, that it is not a Christian church. If you find a Christian church that is not the ancient gifts, for instance the gift of healing, opening the eyes of the blind, unstopping the ears of the deaf, causing the tongue of the dumb to speak and the lame to walk. If you ever find a people calling themselves a Christian church and they have not these gifts among them, you may know with a perfect knowledge that they do not agree with the pattern given in the New Testament. JD 18 171. It stands to reason that if the early Christian church had prophets and prophetesses, and gifts of the Spirit exercised by both men and women, that as members of the true Church of Jesus Christ, we should be experiencing such blessings today. According to Orson Pratt, if such gifts are not in existence, then it is not the same, true Church. Chapter 11. Their Finest Hour. It is inspiring and informative to read the stories of early LDS women who, from their heart and mind, delivered some of the most noble speeches for freedom ever recorded. Here in Salt Lake City, on a very inclement 13th of January in 1870, about five or six thousand women packed the old tabernacle to present their feelings and support for what they considered to be a vitally important priesthood law plural marriage. The Mormons had been suffering from the efforts of vicious mobs, prejudiced ministers, and corrupt politicians. Laws were being passed against the rights of the Mormons to live their religion unmolested. The sisters of the church wanted to make their stand. Only women were allowed to attend these statewide mass meetings except for a few press reporters. Mrs. Zara M. Kimball, as president, was the first speaker. Excerpts from her talk, as well as the remarks of several others, are reprinted here as they appeared in Tullage's Women of Mormondom, showing the valiant defense of these pioneer women in behalf of this eternal priesthood law. We are not here to advocate women's rights, but man's rights. The bill in question would not only deprive our fathers, husbands and brothers of enjoying the privileges bequeathed to citizens of the United States, but it would deprive us, as women, of the privilege of selecting our husbands. And against this we unqualifiedly protest. Sarah M. Kimball, page 381. But Sheba W. Smith remarked. I watched by the bedside of the first apostle, David W. Patton, who fell a martyr in the church. He was a noble soul. He was shot by a mob while defending the saints in the state of Missouri. I was intimately acquainted with the life and ministry of our beloved prophet, Joseph, and our patriarch, Hiram Smith. I know that they were pure men who labored for the redemption of the human family. For six years I heard their public and private teachings. It was from their lips that I heard taught the principle of celestial marriage, and when I saw their mangled forms cold in death, Having been slain for the testimony of Jesus, by the hands of cruel bigots, in defiance of law, justice and executive pledges dot dot dot. I realized that they had sealed their ministry with their blood, and that their testimony was in force. On the 9th day of February, 1846 the middle of a cold and bleak winter my husband, just rising from a bed of sickness, and I, in company with thousands of saints, were driven again from our comfortable home the accumulation of six years as industry and prudence and, with the little children, commenced a long and weary journey through the wilderness to seek another home, for a wicked mob had decreed we must leave. Governor Ford, of Illinois, said the laws were powerless to protect us. Exposed to the cold of winter and the storms of spring, we continued our journey, amid want and exposure, burying by the wayside a dead mother, a son, and many kind friends and relatives. We reached the Missouri River in July. Here our country thought proper to make a requisition upon us for a battalion to defend our national flag in the war pending with Mexico. We responded promptly, many of our kindred stepping forward and performing a journey characterized by their commanding officer as unparalleled in history. With most of our youths and middle-aged men gone, we could not proceed, hence we were compelled to make another home, which, though humble, approaching winter made very desirable. In 1847-8, all who were able, through selling their surplus property, proceeded, we who remained were told, by an unfeeling Indian department, we must vacate our houses and recross the Missouri River, as the laws would not permit us to remain on Indian lands. We obeyed, and again made a new home, though only a few miles distant. The latter home we abandoned in 1849, for the purpose of joining our co-religionists in the then far-off region, denominated on the map the Great American Desert, dot 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 and had found an asylum in such an undesirable country, 
as to strengthen us in the hope that dot 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 no one could feel heartless enough to withhold from us that religious liberty which we had sought in vain amongst our former neighbors. I cannot but express my surprise, mingled with regret and indignation, at the recent efforts of ignorant, bigoted, and unfeeling men headed by the vice president to aid intolerant sectarians and reckless speculators who seek for prescription and plunder. And who feel willing to rob the inhabitants of these valleys of their hard-earned possessions, and, what is dearer, the constitutional boon of religious liberty. But Sheba W. Smith, pages 381 to 384. Sister Warren Smith, a survivor of the Hans Mill massacre, reiterated that tragic story and then said. We are here today to say, if such zines shall be again enacted in our midst, I say to you, my sisters, you are American citizens, let us stand by the truth, if we die for it. Sister Warren Smith, page 386. Mrs. Wilmer Thiest then spoke. It is with feelings of pleasure, mingled with indignation and disgust, that I appear before my sisters to express my feelings in regard to the Cullum Bill, now before the Congress of this once happy Republican government. The Constitution for which our forefathers fought and bled and died bequeaths to us the right of religious liberty the right to worship God, according to the dictates of our own conscience. Does the Cullum Bill give us this right? Compare it with the Constitution, if you please, and see what a disgrace has come upon this once happy and republican government. Where, oh, where, is that liberty, bequeathed to us by our forefathers the richest boon ever given to man or woman, except eternal life, or the gospel of the Son of God? I am an American citizen by birth. Having lived under the laws of the land, I claim the right to worship God according to the dictates of my conscience and the commandments that God shall give unto me. Our Constitution guarantees life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to all who live beneath it. What is life to me if I see the galling yoke of oppression placed on the necks of my husband, sons and brothers, as Mr. Cullum would have it? I am proud to say to you that I am not only a citizen of the United States of America, but a citizen of the Kingdom of God and the laws of this Kingdom, I am willing to sustain and defend both by example and precept. Mrs. Wilmer Thiest, pages 386-87. Sister Eliza R. Snow also addressed the meeting. The entrance of our brave pioneers and the settlement of the Latter-day Saints in these mountain vales, which then were only barren, savage wilds, are events with which not only our own future, but the future of the whole world, is deeply associated. Here they struggled, with more than mortal energy, for their hearts and hands were nerved by the Spirit of the Most High, and through His blessings, they succeeded in drawing sustenance from the arid soils. Here they erected the standard on which the star-spangled banner waved its salutation of welcome to the nations of the earth, and here it will be bequeathed, unsullied, to future generations. Yes, that dear old flag which in my girlhood I always contemplated with joyous pride, and to which the patriotic strains of my earliest muse were chanted, here floats triumphantly on the mountain breeze. Our numbers, small at first, have increased, until now we number 150,000, and yet we are allowed only a territorial government. Year after year we have petitioned Congress for that which is our inalienable right to claim as state government, and, year after year, our petitions have been treated with contempt. Such treatment as we have received from our rulers has no precedent in the annals of history. And now, instead of granting us our rights as American citizens, bills are being presented to Congress, which are a disgrace to men in responsible stations, professing the least claim to honor and magnanimity. Bills which, if carried into effect, would utterly annihilate us as a people. In the kingdom of God, woman has no interest separate from those of man all are mutual. Our enemies pretend that, in Utah, woman is held in a state of vassalage that she does not act from choice, but by coercion that we would even prefer life elsewhere, were it possible for us to make or escape. What nonsense! We all know that if we wished we could leave at any time either to go singly or to rise en masse, and there is no power here that could or would wish to prevent us. I will now ask this assemblage of intelligent ladies, do you know of any place on the face of the earth where woman has more liberty and where she enjoys such high and glorious privileges as she does here as a Latter-day Saint? No. The very idea of woman here in a state of slavery is a burlesque on good common sense. They must be very dull in estimating the energy of female character, who can persuade themselves that women who for the sake of their religion left their homes, crossed the plains with handcarts, or as many had previously done, drove ox, mule and horse teams from Nauvoo and from other points. When their husbands and sons went, at their country's call, to fighter battles in Mexico, yes, that very country which had refused us protection. 
and from which we were then struggling to make or escape I say those who think that such women and the daughters of such women do not possess too much energy of character to remain passive and mute under existing circumstances are reckoning without their host. To suppose that we should not be aroused when our brethren are threatened with fines and imprisonment for their faith in and obedience to the laws of God is an insult to our womanly natures. Were we the stupid, degraded, heartbroken beings that we have been represented, silence might better become us, but as women of God, women filling high and responsible positions, performing sacred duties women who stand not as dictators, but as counselors to their husbands, and who, in the purest, noblest sense of refined womanhood, are truly their helpmates we not only speak because we have the right, but justice and humanity demand that we should. My sisters, let us, inasmuch as we are free to do all that love and duty prompt, be brave and unfaltering in sustaining our brethren. Women's faith can accomplish wonders. Let us, like the devout and steadfast Miriam, assist our brothers in upholding the hands of Moses. But to the law and to the testimony. Those obnoxious fratricidal bills I feel indignant at the thought that such documents should disgrace our national legislature. They not only threaten extirpation to us, but they augur destruction to the government. The authors of those bills would tear the Constitution to shreds, they are sapping the foundation of American freedom they would obliterate every vestige of the dearest right of man liberty of conscience and reduce our once happy country to a state of anarchy. Eliza R. Snow, pages 388 to 393. Next came a very powerful speech by Harriet Cook Young. In rising to address this meeting, delicacy prompts me to explain the chief motives which have dictated our present action. We, the ladies of Salt Lake City, have assembled here today, not for the purpose of assuming any particular political power, nor to claim any special prerogative which may or may not belong to our sex, but to express our indignation at the unhallowed efforts of men, who, regardless of every principle of manhood, justice, and constitutional liberty, would force upon a religious community, by a direct issue, either the course of apostasy, or the bitter alternative of fire and sword. Surely the instinct of self-preservation, the love of liberty and happiness, and the right to worship God, are dear to our sex as well as to the other, and when these most sacred of all rights are thus wickedly assailed, it becomes absolutely our duty to defend them. Let the world know that the women of Utah prefer virtue to vice, and the home of an honorable wife to the gilded pageantry of fashionable temples of sin. Transitory allurements, glaring the senses, as is the flame to the moth, short-lived and cruel in their results, possess no charms for us. Every woman in Utah may have her husband the husband of her choice. Here we are taught not to destroy our children, but to preserve them, for they, reared in the path of virtue and trained to righteousness, constitute our true glory. It is with no wish to accuse our sisters who are not of our faith that we so speak, but we are dealing with facts as they exist. Wherever monogamy reigns, adultery, prostitution and feticide, directly or indirectly, are its concomitants. It is not enough to say that the virtuous and high-minded frown upon these evils. We believe they do. But frowning upon them does not cure them, it does not even check their rapid growth, either the remedy is too weak, or the disease is too strong. The women of Utah comprehend this, and they see, in the principle of plurality of wives, the only safeguard against adultery, prostitution, and the reckless waste of prenatal life, practiced throughout the land. While these are our views, every attempt to force that obnoxious measure upon us must of necessity be an attempt to coerce us in our religious and moral convictions, against which did we not most solemnly protest, we would be unworthy the name of American women. Harriet Cook Young, pages 394, 396, 97. Sister Hannah T. King followed with a stinging address directed to General Cullum himself. My sisters, are we really in America the world-renowned land of liberty, freedom, and equal rights? the land of which I dreamed, in my youth, as being almost an earthly Elysium, where freedom of thought and religious liberty were open to all. The land that Columbus wore his noble life out to discover. The land that God himself helped him to exhume, and to aid, which endeavor Isabella, a queen, a woman, declared she would pawn her jewels and crown of castle, to give him the outfit that he needed. The land of Washington, the father of his country, and a host of noble spirits, too numerous to mention. The Land to which the Mayflower bore the Pilgrim Fathers, who rose up and left their homes, and bade their native home good night, simply that they might worship God by a purer and holier faith, in a land of freedom and liberty, of which the name America has long been synonymous. Yes, my sisters, this is America, but, oh, how are the mighty fallen? Who, or what, is the creature who framed this incomparable document? 
Is he an Esquimo or a chimpanzee? What isolated lander spot produced him? What ideas he must have of women? Had he ever a mother, a wife, or a sister? In what academy was he tutored, or to what school does he belong? The de Sokulian systematically commands the women of this people to turn traitors to their husbands, their brothers, and their sons. Short-sighted man's sections in the bill. Let us, the women of this people the sisterhood of Utah rise on Moss, and tell this nondescript to defer the bill, until he has studied the character of woman, such as God intended she should be, then he will discover that devotion, veneration and faithfulness are her peculiar attributes. That God is her refuge, and his servants her oracles, and that, especially, the women of Utah have paid too high a price for their present position, their present light and knowledge, and their noble future, to succumb to so mean and foul a thing as Baskin, Cullum and Company's bill. Let them learn that they are one in heart, hand and brain, with the brotherhood of Utah that God is their father, and their friend that into his hands, they commit their cause and on their pure and simple banner they have emblazoned their motto, God, am I right? Hannah T. King, pages 397-99. The next speaker was B.B. Woodruff. I have been a member of this church for 36 years, and had the privilege of living in the days of the prophet Joseph, and heard his teaching for many years. He ever counseled us to honor, obey and maintain the principles of our noble constitution, for which our fathers fought, and which many of them sacrificed their lives to establish. President Brigham Young has always taught the same principle. This glorious legacy of our fathers, the Constitution of the United States, guarantees unto all the citizens of this great republic, the right to worship God, according to the dictates of their own consciences, as it expressly says. Congress shall make no laws respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Cullum's bill is in direct violation of this declaration of the Constitution, and I think it is our duty to do all in our power, by our voices and influence, to thwart the passage of this bill which commits a violent outrage upon our rights, and the rights of our fathers, husbands and sons. Shall we, as wives and mothers, sit still and see our husbands and sons, whom we know are obeying the highest behest of heaven, suffer for their religion, without exerting ourselves to the extent of our power for their deliverance? No, verily no. God has revealed unto us the law of the patriarchal order of marriage, and commanded us to obey it. We are sealed to our husbands for time and eternity, that we may dwell with them and our children in the world to come, which guarantees unto us the greatest blessing for which we are created. If the rulers of the nation will so far depart from the spirit and letter of our glorious constitution, as to deprive our prophets, apostles and elders of citizenship, and imprison them for obeying this law, let them grant this, our last request. To make their prisons large enough to hold their wives, for where they go we will go also. V.B. Woodruff, pages 399 to 400. Sister Liza R. Snow gave the concluding remarks. I heard the prophet Joseph Smith say if the people rose and mobbed us and the authorities countenanced it, they would have mobs to their heart's content. I heard him say that the time would come when this nation would so far depart from its original purity, its glory, and its love of freedom and protection of civil and religious rights, that the constitution of our country would hang as it were by thread. He said, also, that this people, the sons of Zion, would rise up and save the Constitution, and bear it off triumphantly. I consider it most important, my sisters, that we should struggle to preserve the sacred Constitution of our country one of the blessings of the Almighty, for the same spirit that inspired Joseph Smith, inspired the framers of the Constitution, and we should ever hold it sacred. And bear it off triumphantly. Eliza R. Snow, pages 401-402. What noble lives of faith and integrity these pioneer women left for men. By precept and example they displayed the finest qualities of mortal souls. They passed on the torch of liberty for later generations to carry and respect. It is up to us to continue in that path and march on in support of those eternal priesthood goals and principles. Chapter 12. Conclusion. Priesthood. Power through obedience. A priesthood problem. Where does the priesthood issue stand today? Some women are pushing to have priesthood conferral something that has never been instituted for women. Some are requesting priesthood offices such as high priests, bishops, state presidents, etc. This, too, is not according to the revelations of God. Others want to have all things equal with men activities in church, in government, at work, and in marriage. There are also those who seek to pray to and worship our mother, as well as, or instead of, our father in heaven. Where will the misunderstandings and differences end? How can we truly understand the priesthood plan which the Lord gave in the beginning? There are some serious problems to solve before the house of God can be set back in order.
If each Mormon partner in a marriage respects the other for what they are and the rightful position they hold in the priesthood order, they should not have the problems that are plaguing our society today. The present generation seeks to put women and men on the same level in the marriage covenant, but this can have confusing results, as Dr. Rodney Turner describes. Both are president of the company. Being a two-headed affair, the modern marriage is, in actuality, headless. Because both preside, neither leads. It is pure democracy. Such marriages are based upon false sociological theories, as well as a fatal misunderstanding of the implications of the psychophysical differences between the sexes. These differences should dictate the valid roles of husbands and wives. In largely ignoring these differences, the modern marriage is essentially a contractual agreement between consenting adults, in which they specify the limitation of their obligations to one another, both qualitatively and quantitatively. It is understood that each is free to pursue his or her own destiny, even though they share certain phases of their lives with one another. Woman and the Priesthood, Turner, page 69. Prof. Turner gave some good advice when he said. The spirit of envy and competition is alien to the spirit of Christ. It is especially inappropriate where the priesthood is concerned. It is, perhaps, a greater sin for a woman to covet a man's priesthood than it would be for her to covet anything else. And there is no need for her to do so. Eternal marriage unites their priesthoods in one, making them a shared blessing. Ibid. Page 287. An equal partnership is formed when each party has a 50% vote in the organization one being able to nullify the other. When this idea is adopted in a marriage, it is no longer a loving, natural companionship, but a corporate stockholder business, and life for both usually becomes confusing, difficult, and often disastrous. The editor of the Millennial Star gave some excellent advice to both wives and husbands. Every dear wife will look with a zealous eye towards the happiness and welfare of her dear husband, and if she is tempted to think he is doing wrong, she will say, get thee behind me, Satan, that is none of my business, I will do right, that is enough for me, and I shall have peace in my soul. And so continue to do, till he has done so wrong that forbearance is no longer a virtue, then give him a divorce and do better if you can, but while you live with him, live in peace, and keep jealousy out of doors, if you don it you will always have hell within, and devils enough to carry it on. The moment you are jealous that your husband is wrong, that moment you are miserable, that misery is proof positive that you yourself are wrong, for it destroys your peace. Some husbands are so mighty big because they are the head that the wife has no room in the house, if she thinks, she thinks wrong, if she speaks, she speaks wrong, if she acts, she acts wrong, she can't do a right thing for the life of her, and do what she will, no matter. She is as likely to get a cuffed ear as anything else, and a little more so, and if she should ask forgiveness, she would meet with the consoling retort from her dear lord, yes, and you'll do the same thing again next minute. Why all this? Because the dear husband, the great lord of the house, has got so many devils in him, they make him so big there is not room for anybody else in that house. Mill. Star 14280. But, according to the lord, a man cannot obtain the fullness of the powers of the priesthood without a woman. In the celestial glory there are three heavens or degrees, and in order to obtain the highest, a man must enter into this order of the priesthood, meaning the new and everlasting covenant of marriage, and if he does not, he cannot obtain it he may enter into the other, but that is the end of his kingdom, he cannot have an increase. D&C 131 1-4. So it appears that in this regard God is favoring women over men, as there will apparently be greater numbers of women exalted than men. A woman's curse. A difficult trial in a woman's life is to live under the curse placed upon her since the days of the Garden of Eden. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, in sorrow thou shalt bring four children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Gen. 3.16. Regarding the first part of the curse that in sorrow thou shalt bring four children, there is a resulting promise that notwithstanding she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. I Tim. 2.15, and Rodney Turner expands upon this by saying, if a woman is saved in childbearing, she is exalted in child guidance. Wom. And PRSTHD. Page 292. Paul also reiterated the second part of the curse in his epistle to the Ephesians. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. F. 
522-24. All women must live under this curse during her sojourn in mortality, and by realizing the fact that it is still in effect, helps to explain the apparent inequalities and injustices toward women today. Brigham Young explained this on many occasions, four of which are included here. True there is a curse upon the woman that is not upon the man, namely that her whole affection shall be towards her husband, and what is the next? He shall rule over you. But how is it now? Your desire is to your husband, but you strive to rule over him, whereas the man should rule over you. Some may ask whether that is the case with me, go to my house and live, and then you will learn that I am very kind, but know how to rule. JD 457. It may be all well enough if a woman can attain faith to throw off the curse, but there is one thing she cannot away with, at least not so far as I am concerned, and that is, and he shall rule over thee. I can do that by causing my women to do as they have a mind to, and at the same time they do not know what is going on. When I say rule, I do not mean with an iron hand, but merely to take the lead to lead them in the path I wish them to walk in. They may be determined not to answer my will, but they are doing it all the time without knowing it. JD 9195. The female portion of the human family have blessings promised to them if they are faithful. I do not know what the Lord could have put upon women worse than he did upon Mother Eve, where he told her. Thy desire shall be to thy husband continually wanting the husband. If you go to work, my eyes follow you, if you go away in the carriage, my eyes follow you, and I like you and love you, I delight in you, and I desire you should have nobody else. I do not know that the Lord could have put upon women anything worse than this. I do not blame them for having these feelings. I would be glad if it were otherwise says a woman of faith and knowledge, I will make the best of it, it is a law that man shall rule over me, his word is my law, and I must obey him, he must rule over me, this is upon me, and I will submit to it. And by so doing she has promises that others do not have. JD 16 167. They Adam and Eve were required to multiply and replenish the earth, and I will here say a word to the ladies do not marvel, do not wonder at it, do not complain at providence, do not find fault with Mother Eve, because your desire is to your husbands. Bear this with patience and fortitude. Be reconciled to it, meet your afflictions and ease little well, we might say, not very trifling, but still they are wants, for if we desire only that that is necessary, and can govern and control ourselves to be satisfied with that, it is a great deal better than to want a thousand things that are unnecessary, and especially to the female portion of the inhabitants of the earth. But there is a curse upon them, and I can't take it off, can you? No, you cannot it never will be taken from the human family until the mission is fulfilled, and our master and our lord is perfectly satisfied with our work. It will then be taken from this portion of the community, and will afflict them no more, but for the present it will afflict them. JD 1513. Edward Tullidge also speaks of the time when women will be redeemed from this curse. The day is approaching when woman shall be redeemed from the curse of Eve, and I have often thought that our daughters who are in polygamy will be the first redeemed. Here is the curse. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Woman will be redeemed from that curse, as sure as the coming of Tomaroa's son. No more, after this generation, shall civilized man rule over his mate, but they twain shall be one and the sisters are looking for that millennial day. These are the wise virgins of the church, and their lamps are trimmed. Women of Mormondom, Tullage, page 506. But until that time arrives when the curse is no longer in effect, Brigham Young advises the husbands to treat their wives as an angel, would treat them, JD 455, and counsels the wives that a man is not made to be worshipped. JD 14 106. Other words of comfort come from Rodney Turner, who softened some of the harsh interpretations of the fall of Adam and Eve, and presented another way of looking at it. When he Adam accepted the forbidden fruit from his Wivio's hand and joined her in mortality, she incurred a debt of gratitude toward the priesthood which she acknowledged by humble acceptance of God's judgment upon her. And in honoring her husband as her temporal lord, in placing her womanly affections upon him alone, and in becoming the mother of all living, she laid down her life for others, as Adam had laid down his life for her. Those women who do the works of Eve become, in fact, her eternal daughters. In emulating their ancient mother, they help to lift whatever curses and limitations the fall has inflicted upon them. Epilogue, Woman and the Priesthood, Turner. Daniel H. Wells says, nevertheless, that happiness can be obtained through a wife's righteous obedience to her husband. I say to the sisters, seek to have confidence in your husbands, and believe that they are capable of leading you, 
and when you seek instruction, believe them capable of giving it to you, and be faithful, humble, and obedient to them. Their feelings should not be concentrated in you, but your feelings should be in them, and there should be in those who lead them in the priesthood. Their feelings are concentrated in the Lord their God and what is ahead, and there is where they should be. You should be glad to see them step forward and walk onward in the path of their duty, and not require them to devote themselves to you to the exclusion of things and duties of life which lie before them. As they progress and lead on, you will feel to travel in the same road. This is the order, and if order is maintained in this thing, you will see the beauty of it, and it will be a satisfaction to you and them to believe that your husband, he who is at your head, is progressing in the things of God. That should be a satisfaction to you, and it will be, if you are inspired by the right spirit and feeling. In this way you will have happiness, and see good times. JD 4 256. Even though the curse will be removed from women, there is still a patriarchal order that continues from this life to the next. The order of heaven places man in the front rank, hence he is first to be addressed. Woman follows under the protection of his counsels and the superior strength of his arm. Her desire should be unto her husband, and he should rule over her. I will here venture the assertion that no man can be exalted to a celestial glory in the kingdom of God whose wife rules over him, and as the man is not without the woman, nor the woman without the man in the Lord, it follows as a matter of course that the woman who rules over her husband thereby deprives herself of a celestial glory. Orson Hyde, JD 4 258. An encouraging word. In conclusion, printed here are two beautiful sentiments expressed for the encouragement of women from the pen of Eliza R. Snow. Inspiration, if not revelation, was the source of such tributes to the honor and glory of women. The first is part of an article entitled Address to the Sisters. It is because I love my sisters and desire to see them maintain the position that God intended them to attain and fulfill that I now address them. It is woman's honorable privilege to be queen of a mighty realm. Mighty in Minutio. Her kingdom cometh not with observation her subjects are the Lilliputians of the earth, and their moral statue will be pygmy, full-grown, or colossal, according as her laws are wise, judicious, and in love, she controls, or ought to do, the elements of life. The germs of future glory and exaltation the rudiments of angelic life. It is her province to mold, to train, to nurture, to support, to feed, to enlighten, to sow seed into the precious mind of infancy and youth. What more noble destiny would she desire? Is she not working for eternity? Most assuredly and her work is for exaltation or condemnation can she do this in her own strength? Certainly not, let her remember, if she goes to the fountainhead of wisdom, and asks, she shall receive to all that ask in sincerity, God giveth wisdom liberally and upbraideth not. Many of the great men of the earth who have risen to eminence and power, have pointed to their mothers, who by their judicious management of their youth the training of their infant minds, and the precious seed, which under God, they were enabled to cast into their minds, they became great. Shall not such instances urge woman to feel her responsibility, to consider the end of her creation? Oh! Most noble is her work mighty is her responsibility. Her first act of government must be self. She has many a battle to fight to conquer that troublesome little empire, her own heart. But. This must be accomplished the foundation must be good, or it cannot support the superstructure. The fountain must be pure, or its streams can never fertilize the young plants that they are destined to renovate and invigorate. The first thing she must learn and then teach is humility, the next obedience, if she wishes to conquer well, she must stoop to do so. Her soul is large enough for all her maker intended her for, and she was made to be a helpmeet for man, these words are penned with the sublime brevity of scripture, but they form a compendium of woman's position, of woman's duty, and of woman's exaltation, brief as they are. They stand as a text to a discourse that would fill every sheet of this star, but that is not for me. If woman really carries out her destiny, she is truly a heroine, if she desire greatness she has it. I will prove it, woman's fear is in the secluded domestic dreams of life, beyond which her name is unheard and unknown. But is he only a hero whose name resounds through the world as the herald of battle and bloodshed? In the eye of the misjudging world such may be such, but when the partition wall is broken down that shuts out the mortal from the immortal, when the scales fall from the human eye, and the veil is removed from human hearts, then shall many an obscure individual stand forth as the sterling soldier of Christ, and many shall be abashed, whose proud banner flaunted over the battlefield of human glory, but who forgot to enlist themselves under the banner of the great captain of their salvation, and disdain to fight in the ranks of the Christian warfare. Is there no heroism in the daily, hourly, struggle of the battle of life, biz? 
to do our duty in the situation of life in which we are placed, in the untiring efforts to bear upward towards the light of truth, and to keep straight in the narrow way that leadeth unto life, to press on through evil report and good report to do our duty to the wayward, as well as to the kind and gentle. To be patient, to persevere, to endure, to be gentle, to be disinterested, to press on in the path of rectitude, not for the praise of men, for often no eye, but God's beholds this inward struggle, and this secret strife of flesh and spirit. But because the soul's eye is resting on that glorious promise, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. What is heroism if this or something of this is not a definition of it? Then I will assume that I have established the fact that every true woman, one who has learned to govern herself and so become fit to govern others, and is weighing her scepter according to the law of her sovereign, is a heroine. For they must be ignorant indeed who do not know that this is but a faint outline of her struggle through life. Her name will be emblazoned on no earthly scroll of fame, her brows may be bound by no coronet of bayer laurel, or diadem of gorgeous gems, but I know it is traced by the recording angel in the chancery of heaven, and sealed with the signet of the eternal. Oh! My sisters, let us again revert to the words woman was made a helpmeet for man. Let us ponder these words in our hearts, man is the delegate of God, woman for his honor and glory. Then the more glorious she is, the more honor she can confer upon him. God is the father of all. My sisters, let us pray then that he will give in us wisdom, that we may ever act as becomes the wives, mothers, and sisters of the servants of God, that we may truly be a crown and an honor to them, and that we may stand side by side with them, as the sons and daughters of the Most High, and can jointly roll on the great work of these the last days, that having been fellow laborers in the vineyard of the Lord, we may together inherit the glories of his kingdom, when the knowledge of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion, and in Jerusalem, and before his ancients gloriously. Mill. Star 13 359 60. Eliza again counseled her sisters in the gospel. To be sure we have many of the crosses of life, but what do we meet them for? Are they for our own good and benefit or do we meet them all as for Zion's sake? Do we let Zion take full possession of our desire, our ambition? Dot dot dot. We have self all absorbed in the interest of the work of God. We are here to perform duties and to do our part towards establishing God's kingdom. We, my sisters, have as much to do as our brethren have. We are to work in union with them. Dot dot dot. Paul the Apostle anciently spoke of holy women. It is the duty of each one of us to be a holy woman. We shall have elevated aims if we are holy women. We shall feel that we are called to perform important duties. No one is exempt from them. There is no sister so isolated and her sphere so narrow, but what she can do a great deal towards establishing the kingdom of God upon the earth. God bless you, my sisters, and encourage you that you may be filled with light. Dot dot dot. And as much as you are wise stewards, you will find time for social duties because these are incumbent upon us as daughters and mothers in Zion. By seeking to perform every duty, you will find that your capacity will increase, and you will be astonished at what you can accomplish. Dot 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 you, my sisters, if you are faithful will become queens of queens, and priestesses unto the Most High God. These are your callings. We have only to discharge our duties. By and by our labors will be passed, and our names will be crowned with everlasting honor, and be had in everlasting remembrance among the saints of the Most High God. Women's Exponent, Bowl. 2. September 1873. John Taylor had a great appreciation for his sister saints, and paid the following tribute to them. Now, crowns, thrones, exaltations and dominions are in reserve for thee in the eternal worlds, and the way is open for thee to return back into the presence of thy heavenly Father, if thou wilt only abide by and walk in a celestial law, fulfill the designs of thy creation, and hold out to the end. That when mortality is laid in the tomb, you may go down to your grave in peace, arise in glory, and receive your everlasting reward in the resurrection of the just, along with thy head and husband. Thou wilt be permitted to pass by the gods and angels who guard the gates, and onward, upward to thy exaltation in a celestial world among the gods. To be a priestess queen unto thy heavenly father, and a glory to thy husband and offspring, to bear the souls of men, to people other worlds, as thou didst bear their tabernacles and mortality, while eternity goes and eternity comes, and if you will receive it, lady, this is eternal life. And herein is the saying of the Apostle Paul fulfilled, that the man is not without the woman, neither the woman without the man, in the Lord. I Cor. 1111, that man is the head of the woman, and the glory of the man is the woman. I Cor. 
11 7 hence thine origin the object of thy creation and thy ultimate destiny if faithful lady the cup is within thy reach drink then the heavenly draft and live the mormon august 29 1857 the path to exaltation is straight and narrow but the promised blessings powers and glories of heaven are attainable in their fullness they can be received only through the marriage of a righteous man and woman women as they share those covenants in the holy priesthood if a woman wants to hold the priesthood she should be married to a man who holds and honors it if she is married to a man who does not have it she should help him acquire it today the true priesthood is hard to find with all the sins of the saints changes in ordinances and ordinations and giving priesthood where it does not belong the real priesthood is becoming more and more difficult to locate as early as 1846 brigham young prophesied of these present-day perils the council requested me to give them instructions I told them that unless this people would humble themselves and cease their wickedness, God would not give them much more teaching, nor would it be long, until the priesthood would be hunted by those who now call themselves saints. Manuscript History of B.Y., pages 476-477, reprinted in Sermons and Writings, Pioneer Press, Bowl. 1. Page 99. Men and women often try to find a shortcut method of receiving the blessings and promises of priesthood. But the holy priesthood is not received by picketing, public pressures, or because of social stature, sex, or race. It is acquired through righteousness, through trial and test, and by walking the straight and narrow path of obedience to eternal laws, ordinances and principles the Lord is restored in this dispensation. President John Taylor spoke of the blessings that result from such righteous living. Oh! If we could comprehend the glory, the intelligence, the power, the majesty and dominion of our Heavenly Father, if we could contemplate the exaltation, the glory, the happiness which awaits the righteous, the pure and the virtuous, of those who fear God, even the saints of the Most High. If we could comprehend the great blessings that God has in store for those people that fear Him and observe His laws and keep His commandments, we should feel very different from what we do. But then, we do not. The Lord has brought us from among the different nations, that we may be educated in the things of the Kingdom of God. He has conferred the Holy Priesthood for that purpose. JD 22 315 16. Questions still remain unanswered regarding priesthood and women's relationship to it, but we do know that a righteous LDS woman, in connection with her husband to whom she has been sealed by priesthood authority, can enjoy the birthright, powers, blessings, rights, privileges, and gifts of the priesthood. She is indeed the most blessed among women. As Eliza R. Snow so beautifully penned about Latter day Saint women, they occupy a more important position than is occupied by any other women on the earth. Associated, as they are, with apostles and prophets inspired by the living God with them sharing in the gifts and powers of the holy priesthood. Dot dot. Participating in those sacred ordinances, without which, we could never be prepared to dwell in the presence of the holy ones. Position and Duties Woman's Exponent 328, July 15, 1874.